but how. It's the motto of this year's festival. We hope you enjoyed as much as we did. So today we want to take our time to not only re reflect on the impressions we all got, but also discuss them together with artists and researchers, jury members of this year's projects. And take the inspiration with us as Ars Electronica Festival may end soon, but as you all know, Ars Electronica itself goes on. And we hopefully see you ag again next year. So to give you a quick overview of what to expect today, the event if itself will take until 4 p.m. And we are excited to get the takes and reflection of the artists and jury members from Preforum's digital communities, interactive art plus as well as computer animations, which will start at around 11.20. We have reserved Q&A slots for you online and as well in the audience. So if you have any questions, there will be a microphone ready for you. And in between these panels, there will be short breaks of about 10 minutes to also be able to reflect on the content. But without any further ado, um, we want to start with an exciting project. It's Roots and Seeds and Plantless plant Planet, Art and Science as a Tool for Plant Resistance. You may have come across it <laughs> uh, already. Um, it's an international cooperation between Ars Electronica, Leonardo Ola from France, University of Barcelona and co-artist from Spain as lead partner and co-founded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union. And it's a project, you will hear that, that tackles the question how we can get better action and behavioral commitments to sustainability by using art and science uh, practices. So I'm very excited to welcome our first panel of today's event and the host, Tatiana Kurochkina. She holds a Master of Landscape Architecture from the University of Architecture of Venice and focuses on landscape research applied to urban biodiversity and sociology. Tatiana is also the curator and producer of art related to science and co-founded the Art and Science Foundation, Quo Artis. Hi, Tatiana. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. So as um, Sarah said, our project is called Roots and Seeds, and the full name of it is Roots and Seeds, Biodiversity Crisis and Plant Resistance. The project started two years ago, and we are about to end it, unfortunately, and all the outcomes of it you will be able to see at Science Park 4. Um, with the roots and seeds, we sustain that we can get better actions and behavioral commitments to our environment through, using, through the use of art and science practices, techniques, methods, and aesthetics. We also, during these two years, developed uh, methods and tools that awaken our passion and emotional connection to our environment, especially to the plants. Mm, this is my clicker. And here are the partners that gathered together to bring this initiative forward. And thanks so much for Creative Europe to believe in us and to co-found us. Through um, these two years, we did all these activities. I wanted to read them, but uh, I have them behind me, so uh, you, you can read them <laughs> yourself. Um, within um, our Panelists, we have uh, the Dr. Claudia Schnuck, who will tell us a bit more about her research on art and science methodology. We also have um, artist Katya Nikitina. She will explain the one of the two artworks that we produced. And um, uh, as you know, we had two grants for production. So one artist is here. The second one, unfortunately, cannot be here with us. So I will introduce the work of Laura Sinti. And uh, you can see it in Science Park 4. This artwork is about um, a plant that is no longer existing in wild. 
It's a, a sort of a palm tree. Its scientific name is um, Encephalorus woody. And the last sample of it in uh, wildlife was found in 1895 in South Africa, and it was brought to Kew Gardens. This specimen is a um, male one, and in order to reproduce, this plant needs a female, or it needs both, um, both plants, a female and a male. So there are many other, you can find in many other botanical gardens, uh, these kind of trees, but they are all clones of the original one that come from Kew Gardens. So the proposal of Laura was uh, that together with the scientists from Kew Garden, they would train the AI and uh, introduce it into the drones, and uh, they will search through the tree recognition system uh, for the female tree in wild in, uh, in South Africa in accordance with, um, with the scientists that work in national parks of South Africa. So this, is, uh, this was one of the grants of Roots and Seeds for this art artwork. It uh, took them about one year and a half to, um, for the in to develop the entire project and this female tree was never found. So um, the artwork, as I said, you can see, and here I would like to present a conceptual, very short video that tells a bit more about how the AI was trained. The multispectral camera takes five photos, one for each wavelength band, red, blue, green, visible to the human eye, and additionally red edge and near infrared, which can only be seen using false colors to the final image. So this tree was a victim of tree hunting, and because it has a very slow growth, it, um, we lost it, basically. Uh, another of the activities that we were doing was called emotional multidisciplinary cartography of the gardens. We did it in def different cities, and um, the way we did it was inviting people from many different uh, professions. There were philosophers, uh, art curators, of course, artists, and definitely scientists, but also representatives of, of social science, uh, economists, architects, um, students. And we were, ask, we were going to the parks, from a big ones to very small ones, and we were asked everyone to find um, two plants that would uh, call their, their attention, and we would ask them to draw those plants. And then we would all gather together and discuss why did they choose it, particularly those plants. And we found out that those discussions were very interesting and almost endless. People didn't want to leave. And this is why we thought that it would be really great to expand uh, this um, way of relating to the plants. And we invited Gabino Carvalho, who is now with us, and he will tell us a bit more. We invited him to structure this activity. And um, this is what he did, and he created these beautiful guidelines, uh, with, and wrote very beautiful texts, uh, positioning himself in a place of a plant. So I would like to invite Gabino, and uh, if someone of you is interested, we have some more of those guidelines. Hi. Hi. And um, here is everyone else. <laughs> so, um. This is Gabino Garbayo, Claudia Schnuck, Katja Nikitina, and Zach. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, um, after this introduction, uh, perhaps the only thing that uh, rests to be said is uh, how, how they, um, the guidelines were actually uh, developed. Um, as 
I am, I'm a landscape designer and a project manager myself. I work for the city of Barcelona. I'm specialized in um, biodiversity promotion and the application of nature-based solutions. And in that uh, sense, my work is fairly mundane, um, deals mostly with problems and solutions, and is a um, day-to-day uh, management of uh, public spaces. And uh, when, when this opportunity to work with uh, roots and seeds came up, one of the first things that happened is I, I was part of one of these uh, cartographies. Um, I remember that I was um, uh, drawing there, and um, I was actually drawing next to, to Claudia, and um, we're sharing these uh, fairly complex silences uh, that you generate when you're paying attention to some subject, and, and, but you're, at the same time you're exchanging bits of information. Um, and, and there is a strange intimacy that comes from uh, having to draw something in the presence of somebody else, especially when you are perhaps it's not your first or main strength. And I remember Claudia was um, drawing this, um, this, doing this very elaborate image of an euphorbia. I was drawing a, a banana plant, a, a musa, um, reflecting on the qualities of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the plant itself and what um, Claudia was doing. Claudia was uh, suffering a bit about you know, having to draw, and I'm a scientist. And, and I was also thinking, you know, um, we're doing this, we have these instructions, we follow them. So when uh, the time came to actually make this, these guidelines, this DIY kit, as we call it, um, what I found is that, um, first of all, um, th there was already an idea. That it was teamwork, and that was very interesting. Tatiana and the rest of the team provided this sort of basic structure, things they wanted uh, written down and, and in a certain structure. Uh, and then we had uh, two proposals, uh, a sort of... Um, quick way, quick, quick go out and draw something that you see or write about something that you see. And then there was this other idea of using uh, the methodology of La Derive, the, the Guy de Bord. And uh, that was actually quite interesting. I had to research a little bit further to understand what was needed. Uh, but then there was the difficulty of uh, the instructions themselves, how you ask people to do something. And I, I, I actually wanted to get, get away from being prescriptive, from, from telling anyone what they had to do or what they had to think. Um, and I tried to, first of all, uh, place myself in, in, in positions where I will be thinking or acting as a plant. What will a plant feel? What will an insect feel? What, um, and trying to give, um, give uh, vegetables, uh, which we tend to think as passive uh, entities, some kind of agency. Um, but the, the method for writing was actually uh, quite simple, even though it's an emotional cartography. What I did was go to the science, go to um, the uh, scientific tests I could find. I started sometimes with uh, journalistic articles, and then I went down until I found the sources. And I tried to establish the, the state of the art, uh, the, state of, the state of the science. And then I tried to work from the uh, facts, or the established facts, into the emotions. So, People say, oh, it's a really um, emotional text. It's really deep. It made me brought up something in me. It's actually it's quite interesting because the texts all spin around interesting facts, obscure facts, or things that we didn't know until recently. And, and that was the method, really. It's just putting myself in the position of another organism, working from the scientific facts up, and then writing a simple, expressive way that allowed people to somehow delve in themselves and bring up something of themselves to the exercise without feeling that they were uh, instructed, propped, um, and therefore I think the great thing about this project is that it seems to be taking a life of, of its own. People are adopting it even without, well, outside roots and seeds, and they're telling us they're using it for many other things, which I think is fantastic. Yes, the other day, um, our, our team member Aitana, she was um, on our space and she saw two people, two guys interested in the guidelines and they were looking at them and she approached them and said, oh, those are the cartography guidelines. And they said, we know, we are from the University of Chicago and we did it with our students. <laughs> this was very, very... Grateful surprise for us. Well, y yes, this seems to be happening. I just got a student who wanted to interview me because they found, again, the cartography on the internet and they're using it for um, research purposes. So I wanted to know more about the methodology and the reasons why we did it this way. And I, um, it makes me a little bit nervous, but at the same time, uh, it means that there is genuine interest and the, the project is taking on a life of its own, is developing in strands in ways we didn't predict. Uh, and that is a very... Uh, lifelike uh, form of art, if you want, you know, it's spreading like, a, mm. like some kind of uh, emotional or intellectual virus through the, uh, through the community. Yeah. 
and also, well, I took privilege to participate in different cartographies, almost in all of them, and they were also different, and according to the as big or the small was the place, people would look at the smallest plant or a big tree, so that was a lot of variety also in the choices that people made. And um, thank you, Gabina. And here is uh, Katya Nikitina. She is a member of the collective called Posthuman Studies Lab. It is based in Russia. And uh, uh, the guys received, there are four members, they received this grant uh, for production in 2021. And uh, here we are with this very complex artwork. And Katya, if you can tell us a bit more about it. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much for having us here and thank you for the possibility to produce the beautiful artwork for the festival. Uh, and I would like to introduce uh, our laboratory uh, because it was started in 2018. Uh, I started to think about creating a space in Russia for multidisciplinary work between artists, philosophers and uh, I invited the philosopher, editor and curator Nikita Sazonov to join me and we prepared together the conceptual site and research plan for Posthuman Studies Lab. We invited also the bioartist and scientist Ippolit Markelov, who is here today with us, and uh, um, later uh, Masha Molokova, a uh, sound artist and dancer joined our team and together uh, we wanted to work with the term posthuman, not in a classical way, but to catch its uh, posthumous side. What is to be like posthumous, posthumous creature, posthumous daughter, posthumous son, how to work with death, especially uh, when thinking is always posthumous process and how to work with the complex inheritance of past generations and be we all the part of this very complex inheritance. And our work, uh, Feral Automated System ULTB1, which you can visit at Science Park 4, continues this series of questions and rethinks how humans, plants, animals, insects, machines are bounded and how labor considered in an automated, non-human terms, can be a joint point for their building in oikos, our homes, our ecologies, our emotional situations, after different cataclysms such as wars, technological disasters and catastrophes. Our work is a network in apocalyptic future where humans play no longer a central role, but still important one. They are like another branches another threads of a big network. And in our project, we show how the active use of plants in USSR after the World War II turned them into equal workers, green proletarians, we call them, and independent actors of the interspecies body of the society. According to Valentin Mendovsky, the experimental gardener, gardener of the time, uh, plants taught humans about communism. Love for green is an important element of communist education, he said in the middle of 20th century. And as the main participants in green building, plants brought new types of connection, connections into society. And by our work, we try to speculate about these types of stable and unstable connections and investigate what we all have in a common. And our human plant network distributed across the post-Soviet space, post-Soviet territories, and 11 people are maintaining its work in real time. The connections uh, inside the network are managed by a plant, rotor, like telephone manager. We call it ULTB. ULTB means tired hogwit leaf as phone manager. So each participant converts their labor into resource inside the network and how exactly this resource will be transported to the center, the plant decides. So the plant, 
It is uh, Heraklium Mantigatsum. It used to be Heraklium Sosnovsky, but likely it doesn't grow around uh, Linz. And uh, we put them in the center of the system to uh, trying to rethink also how we are dealing with toxins, how we are dealing with invasive plants. Plants have a mechanism of electrical impulses uh, transmission that is very similar to the basis of animal nervous system. It called uh, action potential. Plants use these mechanisms for transmitting electrical impulses inside their body. And based on this mechanism and the principle proposed by Andrew Odematsky, Ippolit Markelov, uh, with scientists uh, across the Russia, created and implemented unconventional plant computer that describes, distributes the resource inside the network. So plant decides how our hubs inside the network will be connected. So in short, our network, our work, rethinks the ecological status of vegetal biodiversity as a legacy of the agrobiological experiments. Plants created in the Soviet laboratories and communal households such as Heraclium, Lupinus, Populus still do their labor as green pro proletarians and accumulate toxic resources on the age of abandoned industries. And by collecting the products of their labor into the power source, because we use also in our project redox, redox flow battery to maintain our network, we are using it for starting and, and maintaining the network. This is how we find a friendly, if we also can use this word friendly, <laughs> but rather um, a more ecological way to use toxins that were accumulated within feral and invasive species in order to reconstruct the idea of common, because toxins and invasion uh, can be just reduced from the culture. It should be the part of our lives and coexistence. And uh, we also want to thank a big team that uh, uh, is behind us, that helped us all the time. It is around uh, 20 people, including <laughs> Roots and Seeds, um, and core artists especially. So thank you so much for, um, for help and for helping with producing, pr 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 production of this work, and uh, especially in such a very complex situation, because we cannot produce it in Russia, and we were forced to leave uh, the Russia to produce it in Barcelona. We spent uh, several months outside home, um, working with local communities, uh, and uh, prepare an expedition for the plant together. So thank you so much. There are a lot of um, multi-species connections <laughs> around us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. Honestly, the, the more I listen about this artwork, the more the newer dimensions that I discover about it, it is um, definitely more, very complex and um, very exciting, and I hope that your research will keep on going. And um, yes, about the production, and even uh, this plant became invasive through, uh, as a consequence of a big mistake, agro-political mistake. And now we are facing a very big geopolitical crisis, a war, that was also, it is also a consequence of a big mistake of the agreements that were not done properly. And so the, your artwork has nothing to do with what is happening, but um, all these uh, mistakes that were done by humans, then either plants or either other humans have to pay all the consequences of it. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add about hogwit especially because uh, those times it was a cultural plant and after that it became invasive. And uh, hogwit was a cultural plant when people were treated like a wheat in a concentration you know, camps and gulag. And uh, today <laughs> there is some reversion. So uh, hogwit is something bad, something absolutely toxic. It's a wheat but we should 
somehow to rethink our connections with plants and how vegetal, ve vegetative uh, processes are similar sometimes to uh, our cultural processes, uh, political even, because Hogwit is a very strong politics. Uh, it uh, catches human politics now. It, it tried to fight. May, uh, and uh, uh, of course, in Russia, people are calling this plant uh, the Stalin's revenge. But at the same time, this is not the Stalin's revenge. This is rather revenge because of uh, big mistakes in agrobiological laboratories in, in 40s. And uh, this is how we should um, think, always remember about responsibility and about uh, legacy which we have. Uh, that is very complex all the time. Yes, and I was just making a connection uh, with the artwork of Laura that was working with the drone, and I was remembering how to search the colonies of Heraklium Sosnovsky in Russia, they're also using drone, <laughs> drones to find them and to eradicate them badly, and then all the drones that are used for military purposes, so, uh, so different uses uh, to eradication. Or, uh, well, we can discuss all that endlessly. And uh, here with us is um, Claudia Schnuck, who did a research on art and science uh, collaborations and practices. Could you please tell us a bit more, in, <laughs> if you can, in a short? Uh, thanks, yeah, I try to be mm -hmm. short. And it's mm -hmm. actually quite uh, difficult to follow up this very, um, yeah, uh, distracting uh, conversation also, uh, talking about politics and talking about um, all these um, mistakes uh, made by humans. So uh, my name is Claudia Schnuck and uh, I'm an academic researcher uh, working about art and science collaborations. Why should artists and scientists work together and how is it also relevant for politics or, or industries? Uh, but I'm also curating uh, um, at the intersection of art and science. So um, I was first introduced to Roots and Seeds uh, at its beginnings actually, uh, also for the first cartography. So I was then very happy to be invited to do some more research. And actually this research was uh, also connected to the two production grants and the two uh, research residencies for artists that uh, Roots and Seeds was able to support uh, to better understand how to uh, work together at these intersections of art and science and how to uh, create also a supportive um, uh, environment for the artists and for the scientists to work together and to understand each other and to support them also to go beyond uh, um, their first ideas and beyond uh, mainly transmitting information but also to uh, uh, challenge themselves and challenge each other. Um, and then we actually also went on to uh, do some more research about uh, what are interesting projects and uh, at the intersection of art and science uh, that um, tackle uh, biodiversity crisis and sustainability issues. So we researched about uh, 55, 56 projects worldwide um, that do work at this intersection and uh, try to have an impact, uh, societal impact, political impact, or an impact on the arts world. Uh, to, um, yeah, to tackle this issue, but also to educate uh, and to support uh, positive developments. Um, in this research, we then uh, did some more, uh, about 20 in-depth interviews with projects. And we then were asked to um, find the three uh, champions, uh, uh, Roots and Seeds champions, uh, the best projects that we find that have uh, really interesting uh, development, really interesting collaborations, but also uh, valuable societal impact. We could not decide on three, we decided on four. Uh, so the four projects are very diverse. Um, the first one was, um, it, it's not a specific order, so there was Minka Lab from Colombia. Uh, there was uh, previously called the Arctic Cycle, um, uh, a project from Canada, and uh, now it's the Arts and Climate Initiative, um, Artport Making Waves, and the fourth one was uh, Genomic Astronomy, and we have the pleasure to have 
Zach from Genomic Gastronomy with us today. Uh, and I think before I speak too much about uh, why we uh, chose the projects and um, what the projects are about, I invite Zach to um, introduce Genomic Gastronomy and their work. Um, thanks, Claudia, and thanks, uh, Tatiana, for having me on the stage. Um, I'm going to give a very um, surface-level introduction to our practice, and it's pretty well documented online. Um, but hopefully this gives you a sense of what we've been up to uh, for the last 12 years. So, my name is Zach Denfeld, and I'm the co-founder of the Center for Genomic Gastronomy. Um, we began in 2010. I started it with uh, my partner, the Norwegian artist-designer Kat Kramer. And over the last, I guess, 12 years, we've been collaborating with scientists, chefs, farmers, and hackers um, in Asia, North America, and Europe. We'd love to work in South America, but uh, we haven't yet. Um, and so uh, we describe ourselves as an artist-led think tank. That's because we use a lot of artistic research strategies, but we're often trying to engage unexpected audiences. And in some cases, those might be policymakers or um, health ministers. And so our artworks, in addition to hopefully being interesting to a general audience, have some real um, meaning and impact for specialized audiences. Um, we have a mission statement, which is uh, to prototype alternative culinary futures, um, to map food controversies, and to imagine a more just, biodiverse, and beautiful food system. So we try to make sure that all of our projects are uh, working on one of those uh, three angles. So I'll just talk about, um, about six projects uh, very quickly, and I'd like to uh, show a bit of a journey how we moved from a focus on uh, kind of the biotechnologies and biodiversity of human food systems to really spending most of our time with plants. Uh, so the image that you see currently on the screen is from Cobalt 60 sauce. It's a barbecue sauce made from mutation bread ingredients. So we kind of looked around supermarket shelves and through databases to identify um, plants that had been um, mutated after World War II uh, by different state um, uh, nuclear breeding programs. This is kind of interesting in terms of open source in that community because all of this data is published uh, by the IAEA. And as we looked at other kinds of biotechnologies like transgenic uh, techniques, um, a lot of that is confidential business information. So it's very hard to find uh, that kind of information. So these kinds of projects like the barbecue sauce is a chance to assemble these unusual plants and let people taste them and sort of um, debate and digest that recent history of science. Um, smog tasting is on here because um, we're interested not only in the organisms but their environments and that includes humans. And it turns out that air pollution um, makes us taste differently. Our taste buds are deadened uh, in very strong air pollution. Um, but different air pollution, different smogs have different flavors. So we've been collaborating um, with scientists to do this work in a variety of ways, using egg foams to capture the taste of air pollution, um, or doing smog pairings, where we actually fabricate smogs from different cities, let people eat them and pair them with the food from those places. Um, this has become a really important work for us because um, we got to collaborate with the World Health Organization and serve the um, uh, health ministers from every country in the world, smog from different cities. And that was really, um, I think, powerful for uh, those ministers in part because they got, they got to sort of um, be shamed in public about which of their countries had really bad smog or what smog tasted really strongly. And why this relates to plants uh, was because as we started understanding um, smog and where it comes from, one of the typologies of smog is agricultural smog. And so when you have really intensive animal production, um, there's off-gassing from the manure, but also when you're spraying too many chemicals, there's chemicals entering the uh, atmosphere. So um, the way that we farm is actually causing its own distinct type of smog. And obviously that needs to change. Um, a big issue about getting a local is to sort of um, imagine and taste different futures that are from a place. So we do a lot of work around taste and place, uh, both maybe historical, uh, today and tomorrow. What could this place that we're sitting in taste like? 
and the Loki Food Lab um, uses sort of maps of bioregionalism to design menus and gives people a chance to order off a menu based not on the ingredients, but based on their values. So when people visit this food lab, they get to sort of identify what's important to them and um, get a menu based on that. And it's been really interesting working with cultural institutions to put this on, for example, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, because we have to work with their cafes often and force them to form new relationships with farmers, mm -hmm. which you would think would be fairly easy, but it's actually not only a lot of paperwork, it's really retraining or, or collaborating with um, a kitchen staff to understand that smaller regional producers are gonna um, bring their produce, their, their fruit and veg in different ways than a really large multinational. But it gives me a lot of hope because I think that um, these kinds of institutional buyers partnering with our local farmers can make a, a really big difference. So we can start with museums and schools and hospitals and be sort of relocalizing our food system. Mm -hmm. But it does take a real creativity in the way that chefs and kitchens use those plants that are coming into their uh, site. Um, we really like to make sure that people can taste different food futures and have that embodied social experience that was talked about yesterday. Uh, what can museums do that's maybe different than looking at your phone? You can be in the same room with different people, uh, having a social experience, and in this case, using food to sort of um, bring out those difficult or uh, compelling or surprising uh, futures and not just talking about them in the abstract. So we like to get um, some photographs of people um, having those experiences in real time. Uh, in terms of um, imagining a more just, uh, beautiful food system of tomorrow, we have gotten very interested, as everyone has, in soil. And um, plants are both extremely exciting but extremely difficult because they don't move. They're often maybe um, not as initially compelling uh, as organisms to people um, because they kind of just sit there. But once we start using techniques like you see here of isolating the microorganisms that live inside of the plants, the complexity of plant life really comes out to people. And um, we hope that this kind of research that we can do as citizen science um, can actually start to replace the chemical inputs that we're doing with farming. So the picture here is a collaboration we did with the Shrishti School of Art, Design, and Technology in Bangalore, where we ran a citizen science lab um, for people uh, in Goa to uh, isolate the microorganisms that live inside of plants and to hopefully use those uh, in future farming practices. Just a couple more. Um, this is one of our first projects called Glowing Sushi. Um, it was, the, it was a cooking show that featured the first genetically modified animal that you could um, buy, and then we decided to eat with it. This is the not in California roll, because at the time this organism was um, outlawed in the state of California, in the United States. And I think ourselves and maybe our peers have gotten really good at using critique um, as a mode and, and critiquing the sort of failures of contemporary science and technology. And as artists working with technology and science, we're often complicit in those critiques. Um, and as we did this project, more and more we wanted to not only not work with uh, animals, including fish, and work with plants, we wanted to slow down and, and find ways that we could um, prototype the futures that we wanted to see. And there was a really lovely conversation yesterday about um, not utopia, um, but protopia, and prototyping those uh, futures that we aspire to. So this is uh, less of the work that we've done. It is very fun and glowing, but it, 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 makes, feel, it makes one feel a bit... Um, uh, unsatisfied about what's uh, being offered. But the thing I wanted to focus on was that there w is a culture that this organism came out of, and that was a culture of biotechnology that has a long journey. And to sort of um, start to turn our brains to hold in high regard the cultures of yeah, gardening or farming that have amazing innovations but aren't necessarily um, held up in the same way that we do the science lab. Okay, um, we need to put our bodies back on Earth, uh, take the phones out of our face and understand that we inhabit uh, our own bodies and spaces. And so to flavor our tears is an experiment, experimental restaurant where the human body is the food. And so you can see here a visitor to one of our installations feeding their dead skin cells to uh, fish in a fish tank. The fish feces feeds the plants 
and then the humans can consume the plants. And so it's a sort of a cyclical system uh, where the humans uh, feed the system and then they eat out of it. Uh, I wouldn't do this on scale, but it's nice as a provocation and it helps uh, people put themselves back in their bodies and understand that they themselves are inputs for other um, ecological processes. Um, and finally, finally uh, there was an amazing uh, call yesterday um, to slow down in the face of the climate emergency, which seems like a contradiction in terms, but so much of the work that we have to do with plants and the environment are slow processes. Mm -hmm. So recently we were talking to a, a policymaker in the Netherlands who said, you know, it's really hard to get uh, farmers over the age of even 50 to change their farming practices, even if they want to, because it's a five or eight year investment to regenerate the soils. And if you're 50 years old, you're kind of seeing, well, I don't have time for that. So they, that policymaker was really focusing their energy on the younger farmers who have that time left on their you know, land to do that change. Uh, this image is from our recent research into food forest. And we have a lot of food forest fantasies happening here in Europe. And I think they're amazing, but they're five, 10, 15 years until they can do the ecological work that they need to do. And so as we're facing this climate emergency, slowing down and working with plants that um, need like a decade uh, of attention before they can do what they need to do is um, our current challenge. And it's, it's, a, cha it's a difficult one, but I think um, it's, uh, it, it brings a lot of uh, joy and hope to understand that you can slow down even though there's an emergency in front of us. Um, See, so yeah, that's what we've been up to. Thanks a lot, Zach. And it was uh, yesterday we discussed with you this thematic of working with artists and farmers and actually without knowing you in person, in co-artists we were thinking about the same because our project Roots It Seeds it's about to end but we really would like to move forward with, um, um, with it and we would like to reapply for the second edition but this one we wanted to make less theori theoretical than the one we did, even that we produced a lot of things, but we also did a lot of research, not the only one of Claudia, but some others. And the, but the second edition, we wanted to go into the root of the problem that causes the biodiversity crisis in the plant world and in all other worlds, because everything is at the end correlated. And we were thinking of bringing artists together with farmers, uh, to, uh, with another institution um, that would like to join the project. They are based in Italy, they are called Kilowatt. And we were discussing with the, um, this need and this urgency, but also this um, kind of um, rejection from the <laughs> on the farmers' side to do to implement any change on on the way how they were doing things for for decades. Or, so I, it could be uh, very nice if we can come up to some projects together. That sounds lovely, and uh, I was just thinking about how we, there's a big conversation about transdisciplinary work uh, mm -hmm. at the conference, and we say art and science, and we really hold in high regard, as we should, academics and other kinds of applied uh, scientists. Um, but these um, other communities uh, that have such uh, strong knowledge and innovation to share, uh, like farmers, um, I think really bringing those kinds of practitioners into the conversation and saying, um, you know, someone who's a cheesemaker um, or a beer brewer or um, a permaculture farmer has a lot to contribute to those conversations. And so I'd be excited to, mm. um, you know, diversify some of those disciplines uh, outside of the academy that we're looking to really uh, collaborate with. And um, I would love it if next year mm -hmm. Ars Electronica had as many farmers as it had um, <laughs> coders. You know? That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. That would be really great. Well, I, I, I was listening to you talking about this very interesting um, project, and was, what was resonating with me was um, an anecdote from my grandmother. She was, she was a, a peasant, she was a farmer, she didn't have much land, so she always lived till very late as a, as a person from the land, you know, and she, for many years, she used to buy milk directly from a dairy farm, and uh, then we, in Spain, went to the European Union. Uh, the rules changed and you could no longer sell milk in bulk. Mm. It had to be bottled and packaged and posterized and all these things. And she had a hard time uh, because she couldn't get milk. 
And I said, why don't you buy from the supermarket? And she said, I'm not going to drink milk from a cow I don't know. Mm. <laughs> At yeah. the time, I didn't understand anything, but the more um, we, we sort of moved forward and advanced, and our uh, food safety is becoming increasingly more sophisticated, and at the same time, fragile, as uh, the conflict with Ukraine is showing, you know, where the main thing was getting wheat out of uh, Ukraine to feed the world. Um, and listening to other anecdotes, like uh, during our workshop about community allelopathy, where uh, a person was explaining, a participant was explaining how she was growing parsley and some other herb that was a poisonous plant, but she didn't know it and couldn't differentiate it well from parsley. And she was getting these massive rashes uh, by eating something she didn't know what it was, but she thought it was parsley. And in the end, she realized it was a poisonous plant. And I think all these points bring us to the uh, it's a very strange idea that we are eating stuff we don't know what it is, we don't understand, we don't know where it comes from, but we call it food security. Mm. And it's uh, directly, intimately related with the lack of knowledge of what we are doing. And I think in a way, we may be scaling up the agrobiological mistakes of uh, uh, early communist states, you know, by thinking that, yes, this is the future, but maybe it's the opposite, you know. We're going towards our self-destruction. We're poisoning ourselves very slowly, but surely. Actually, these points were also very central to our selection process of the four winners um, in, this, in this Roots and Seeds. Um, we cannot even say competition, but research, uh, because we were really interested in how um, artists and scientists work together and can work together um, and, and sustain this collaboration over longer periods but at the same time have um, social impact, and social impact um, going beyond science communication or communicating about what is the policy that we want to reach uh, with these next actions and next steps that are very uh, documented in very abstract uh, papers, but uh, how to really uh, in engage experience with the body and reach out to different communities. Uh, so. I think uh, genomic gastronomy is, is a wonderful example for that. Um, so you've got this, uh, uh, yeah, this way to reach out to um, different kind of communities, to actually anyone. So there's the audience of the artwork, but then there's the scientists you work with, then there's the cultural institutions and, and uh, also scientific institutions that are interested in collaborating uh, and in reflecting um, past issues and current issues and, and past decisions and future decisions. Um, and then bringing this even that far that you can collaborate or, or show your work to policymakers and to ministers. <laughs> so it, mm -hmm. it, uh, this, is, this is something super influential, but something that uh, the collaboration between art and science is, uh, uh, makes it so rich because um, it's more than uh, I try to um, yeah, translate from one discipline via art uh, to, a great, uh, to a great audience, but really to create experiences and to create new ways of insights because you also add your artistic research there. And uh, going back to uh, also the rural communities and, and farmers, um, one of the other projects, Minka Lab in Colombia, they actually also use exactly this. So they uh, try to engage with uh, local farming communities, uh, get to know, uh, uh, to understand how they deal with seeds and local plants in an environment where activism is super difficult and um, where it's also um, policy to use more um, uh, modified plants or standardized plants for Westerners instead of local plants and thus also have a very severe impact on their local ecosystem. So they try to educate farmers, they try to educate local communities. They use art, but they also use um, a way to reach out to um, the traditional cultures and traditional ways of knowing, which then uh, engage with um, uh, traditional rituals of communities uh, living there, but also ways of um, trying to aesthetically engage with these plants to see what is actually the plant doing to the soil, how is the plant um, yeah, behaving in the ecosystem, mm -hmm. uh, and then they also try to link this uh, 
to science, uh, as to scientific insights uh, from, from, from the biosciences, agricultural studies, but also with, um, with technology uh, and to connect these communities to become more, yeah, to get more agency. So I, I think this is also something that's uh, really uh, striking about these projects because they uh, can also empower um, people from, from different communities and, uh, yeah, have a, uh, yeah, and, and connect differently uh, or connect in a way that is not, I educate you, but I empower you and I try to uh, connect to your way of knowing and try to create a, an ecosystem of knowledge. Yes, thanks. Thank you, Claudia. I just came back from Ecuador where we had a project and um, I went there a, a bit earlier before the project started and I traveled around and I spoke to many different people and in Ecuador less than a month ago there was a huge process, protest of indigenous communities that, was, that lasted for, it basically left the country for 18 days in a state of alarm because the indigenous people were pro pro protesting so badly they basically cut all, all the roads and there was, well, it was very dramatic for the country. And they signed an agreement with the government uh, for many, asking to change many things and let's see what will happen now if the government will uh, fulfill what their promises. But uh, when I was talking to, to the people from indigenous communities, they uh, still, there is, they are still allowed to sell, for example, med medical plants in a certain markets only. And you can visit them and you see the bunches, huge bunches of these medical plants and they do, uh, they can do the rituals of, um, the cleaning rituals uh, in situ there. And um, when you talk to them, what, hap what is happening with, um, uh, with the food, with the, Western uh, medicine, and they are, they tell you very basic things. They are people who are in such a contact with nature. They say, "Oh, if you take a medicine, then you eliminate it with you, and you contaminate the soil, and then you grow. Everything grows on the contaminated soil. This attachment is this way of how they connected to the soil and to every living organism that was growing from the soil was." really so um, uh, moving and this is an obvious example how we all lost all that connection here where we are where we live how we don't feel it any anymore and uh, we somehow really with art and science practices we have to go to the very simple uh, ways of living but I don't know how possible it is, how <laughs> realistic it is. Well, maybe I can add one thing, and this is a photo you see here, actually, at still up, is in like the most modernist place I've ever lived, the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it still <laughs> believes in the modern project. But I think the food forest, and this is um, uh, Wouter Van Eck's uh, food forest there, Kettlebrook Food Forest. They have a problem because even if um, you really just focus on the scientific way of knowing and not other ways of knowing, cultural, spiritual, et cetera. And you know, he's telling us about the intercropping and the different species and how they support each other. And the scientists at the big agricultural university in the Netherlands can't process this information because they've been so siloed, they'll send the bird specialist to go see his site because the birds are coming back. They'll send the insect specialist because there's such rich biodiversity of insects, but they don't come together. And so there's a real frustration even here for this sort of person who's I think you know, deeply engaged in the history of you know, high modernist science and agriculture and ecology. It says, why, I don't want you coming individually. You must come with a buddy. So, like, come get some other scientists you don't know because you're not going to understand the power of this uh, potential of agricultural future by siloing it and trying to uh, pick it apart. And so I think that's maybe also one of the things I hope the arts can do is that by visiting these sites where, where, where people have implemented a variety of knowledge systems um, and, and making those... Uh, more compelling and sort of uh, unifying them can invite scientists in who maybe uh, have some shyness because they say, well, I'm deeply knowledgeable about this subject, but I can't say anything about the birds on the insect person. And so, you know, using the arts to kind of create that a moment or space where some of the experts can come and talk across their expertise 
uh, I think is also really exciting. I'm moving a bit closer, as um, we want, of course, before the panel ends, give uh, you the chance, if there is any questions, to please ask them to our panelists, uh, since we have you here. And one we got from online is, since you mentioned Roots and Seeds is coming to an end, and you made, I think, at least a little bit of a teaser that there may be, might be a Roots and Seeds 2.0. So there, uh, it's the question about the future, how it's going on. And this is, is, is an online question. So if you take your time to answer it, what are you uh, up to? Uh, thank you so much for the interest. Yes, we are discussing this possibility with the, with the partners. And actually, Ars Electronica said that they will join us for the second edition. Um, Leonardo Olot, they cannot do it because of the size of their organization. And they have already another project. So we're in this phase of creating the proposal. So the kilowatt from Bologna will join instead. And uh, we are thinking to make it more hands-on project, more practical. And we will continue to develop that emotional connection because this is what is sometimes lacking even in the di discussion between artists and scientists. Sometimes there are even still very theoretical. And I think that we need to bring more and more em emotional connection. And um, so we as an audience have something to look forward to. There's yes. a question in the audience. Yeah. Hi. Just one question for Katia and all the posthumans. I, I did appreciate the, uh, the artwork. And, and uh, you know, even though it, it took a, a while because it's so sophisticated and complex and therefore astonishing, but it was really great. So you said, Katia, that uh, you had to, to, you could not produce in Russia, so I guess is because of the war. So how this conflict is affecting your uh, creativity, your artworks, and your normal activity? Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I have no prepared answer. But I should say that uh, uh, half a year uh, since uh, war is uh, during now, uh, uh, we were saving our faculty, students, and culture, trying to prevent it from this cen censorship. And because um, uh, all in our group are involved in education for artists, with artists, and we, a lot, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, classes in university. And uh, we try to save our programs and uh, to discuss uh, the current situation and help artists to continue their practices in, on the independent platforms in Russia that are about, well, they are hiding, I, I, I think. Uh, yeah, and we uh, use uh, uh, the lag language, special language, to resist. Uh, maybe it's rather, mo maybe, <laughs> Um, even maybe plant language, <laughs> how <laughs> to resist. And now uh, all this, uh, re well, for me, for example, uh, it is very touching project resist like bacteria because it is about uh, current situation f uh, in Russia for people who are still trying to fight uh, their culture and uh, to overcome um, the political situation and helping people who from different uh, points cannot participate openly. Hmm. Thank you so much for your in really um, exciting and also inspiring takes. Um, if you, I'm, I'm coming to you, uh, I, I know that, if, if you want to know more about the project, you can also find Roots and Seeds, of course, on the Ars Electronica website. Um, I pass the microphone once more over uh, to you, Tatiana, before we go then into a short break and we'll be excited uh, to welcome um, the panel Computer Animation. But of course, I want to do, uh, we can't do it without a quick round uh, going around like um, your takes also and your experiences from uh, this week for you. Well, it was amazing. I just see that I have, someone wants to have a question. For oh. Yes. Oh my God! Yes, this is this is because you know we are in the spotlight. So I'm, I'm so sorry I didn't see you. One last question is always perfect. So I'm sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, my name is Ian from Vienna, and uh, we um, I'm in a group of um, people, and one of us has inherited an excellent piece of land in in Austria, and we want to do something in this direction: education, forestry, dairy farming, and so on. Where do we go to get information? How to 
begin with such a thing. If I understood it correctly, it was turn a dairy farm into agroforestry? No, it's more, it's, it's, the area is functional. Mm. The farm that she has inherited is dysfunctional. So there's buildings and everything. So we could make maybe a, um, a hotel out of it, an mm. educational center. So I the mean, direction that you're going is more like educational center. Yeah, yeah. So involving all the farmers and maybe inviting artists to, to, to create a, a center for learning. Oh, cool. I, I maybe maybe Tatiana, you have a better answer for the cultural side. I thought it was more strictly farming, but I think there are some really amazing um, uh, projects coming up, especially in Spain and Portugal, a bit, uh, in Italy. I know there's a famous one in Sweden. Um, I, I can share some of those uh, sites with you, but they've you know created these spaces um, for art and culture around either farming or rural life, um, and they've been uh, yeah pretty pretty inspiring. Um, I would say, you know, like any undertaking like that, it just does a lot of um, human hours. So making sure you have some people that really want to just be there on site and inviting in. And then depending how far away it is, I think one of the big challenges for those initiatives is making sure that people from different geographies can get there. So urban and rural. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah. And I think we can discuss it uh, after, uh, but it, the research of Claudia can also be useful for you, so we can share, of course, it's uh, totally open source. And, and I think that these projects, they work best when they are connected to other people, to the networks of other people, so this, um, definitely we will share it with you. So thanks a lot for um, hosting us and for giving us this space and welcome everyone to sign Science Park 4 building. We still have one day left. <laughs> Thank you all so much for these exciting takes and also, as you know, I mean, uh, all the panelists are here, so if you are excited in the projects, uh, you can just talk to them or uh, visit their websites. Thank you so much for being here. We're going for a short break and see you again soon. Wenn ich dann auf der Bühne bin, um die Slides zu präsentieren, das wäre ah, ich frage dort hin. Ich frage, ich, ich frage mich jetzt nur für Sicherheit, wenn ich dann auf diesem Break äh, auf der Bühne sitze, die Slides zu präsentieren, 
and she said she really wants to see what it's like here in public in this way. And it's hard to impress them because they, you know, they're like, oh my god, they got me a little bit happy. And it was simple, it was too simple a room, but it's really a room. Mm -hmm. And it's a round in room, and they can make their music. And the girl who plays the piano, she's Jessica, and her music is really easy. But I, you know, when you talk with people, you have to say to them, you know, a way that she's practicing this. Sorry, I had to look for Gerfried Stocker because they warned me that if I say next up Gerfried Stocker, he tends to not to be here. And then I'm the idiot who says, So I welcome Helen. I, 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 I um, please welcome Helen as well. Yes. Um, and yes, yes, do I welcome her at the beginning? Because I'm only introducing Isabel, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm doing a lot of introduction to Isabel. Mm -hmm. Is coming?
Gipfel, ähm, also sozusagen es ist geklettert und dann, und, und dann haben die nach dem Ende Ostern eine unterdessen vorbei und das war dann leider sehr, sehr, sehr leid. Ich glaube, das ist sehr gut. No, 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 I'm, I'm excited. He was waiting I'm always for the a bit nervous, and always. And then there was someone with the microphone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think, I mean, we already prepared the questions for, for the, for the uh, winners. <laughs> Thank you.
<lacht> das Schlimme ist, das ist die Wahrheit. Ich rede schnell. Nur eine Chart, glaube ich. Welcome back to our wrap-up session of this year's Ars Electronica Festival, where we take a look back in the week and ahead into the future, according to the motto of this year's festival, Planet B, a different life is possible. But how? My name is Sarah Krischer. I work for the Austrian public radio station U1. I also had the honor to be at the Digital Community Jury, and today it's my honor to be your host to this session. So uh, the panel coming up will be the pre-forum computer animation, which will be hybrid as not all panelists were able to come here in persona. And your hosts will be Helen Starr and Isabel Avers. We are very excited to soon be hearing from you. But before we get there, I I want to get your attention to only one slide, which I guarantee you will find really interesting. Because when I said before we look back into the future, I literally meant it. This is the pre Ars Electronica in numbers and statistics. Because we want to be very transparent about it and, of course, also learn from the data. So, what you can see here on the upper left um, is starting from 1987, the submissions per category. You see, for example, um, their digital music is on the race, which might not only implicate that there's a lot more submissions, um, but the digital tools to put thoughts into music became perhaps also more accessible. And below you see, also starting in 1987, um, the Golden Nika winners divided into male, female and group. You see the ups and the downs, but if we take the average starting from 2017 up to today, it's a 30% male, 30% female and 40% group. So it seems quite balanced, which also leads us to the chart <laughs> um, on the right. Where is it? Um, I have to tell it to you because it isn't here, but trust me now, um, you can <laughs> get the data uh, too. Um, this year, we are proud that 2,338 projects from 88 countries have submitted. Some of them you will meet in our next panel. Before that, I'm going to pass the microphone, I already see him, to Gerfried Stocker. Many also call him the man who doesn't need to be introduced. 
Um, but having seen or seeing these numbers and statistics, I want to add that Gerfried is the artistic director of Ars Electronica since 1995. Um, so you know what this means. It's the time when the creepy sound of modems guided your way uh, to the internet. Um, Gerfried, look how far we've come. Very welcome. We are happy you're here. Applause, you Thank guys. Thank you very much. Yes. I like these moments at the festival when I'm introduced <laughs> uh, because then sometimes I'm remembered in all this uh, bus and in, in dance activities. Uh, yeah, what we are all doing, you saw these charts, I think uh, pre as Electronica has a very interesting history. It's a history that is of course not just uh, the storyline of uh, technology or the storyline of how uh, artists and creative people are using, purposing technology, rethinking technology. It's of course also uh, a storyline of how society worked in these periods of time, how our perspectives uh, changed in these decades of this pre Electronica and how it always has been reflected by the artists. And I think um, it's a, a very important part of every festival to have this pre ars Electronica Forum. Even so, I mean, I only have to apologize for all our audiences who were partying very heavy the last two nights. And of course, Saturday morning, uh, Sunday morning is not the best time uh, to host such uh, interesting talks, but uh, the real value of what we and you are doing uh, now again is the archive. And whenever you are interested in all these developments and also this kind of yeah, rowdy journey that sometimes these developments takes, please have a look at our pre, uh, pre as Electronic Archive. Uh, you can go online, uh, all the prize-winning works, the awarded works, you find them from 1987 to this year. And this is really a, a, such a precious uh, resource uh, of information and insight and I think also of inspiration. And uh, it's great that this year with the wonderful prize winners of this year, this year also with uh, the presentations and the discussions now in the pre-forum, we can so say, add another brick stone into uh, this archive, uh, not only the archive as a set of Prius Electronica, but I think of our digital world at all. So without any further ado, thanks uh, uh, on behalf uh, of all the people who worked very hard in the jury selection. You can imagine what, how much work is necessary to uh, start with uh, this award, make the open call, have thousands of submissions, and then all these experts who are step by step uh, going through the works, looking at all the works, and finally singling out uh, the prize winners that we are again here uh, to honor today. Uh, thanks uh, to uh, all of you in the jury, and in particular, of course, thanks to the artists, and one more time, congratulations to the wonderful work that you did. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the stage is yours. Is this on? Testing, testing, one, two. Okay, it's on. Okay, I'll test mine. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Um, hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to our wonderful discussion today. I'm Helen Starr. Uh, I'm an Afro-Carib uh, producer, curator, and commissioner. And today I have the absolute pr pleasure to be in conversation with the Golden Nika winner, Rashad Newson, who's sitting right here next to me. How are you t today, Rashad? I am okay. Um, well, first I want to say uh, thank you to the festival for having me. I want to give a special shout out to Emiko, who I think is probably one of the people I've been in touch with the most since I've been here, and also Masha for being so uh, helpful. And um, thank you all for recognizing um, the work that was put into being and honoring that um, with an award. Um, uh, in terms of like how I'm feeling, mm. to be honest, I'm kind of like on my way of coming out of a trigger. And so it kind of makes me think about the question that you asked me when you gave me the award of like, what is the role of arts and artists um, in like uh, racial change? And I think I was thinking a lot about that this morning as I was coming out of that trigger and I was like, I think one of the roles is like accountability and holding people accountable. And so, you know, like, Originally, this discussion was supposed to happen with me, the other artists, and Isabel. But in our email correspondence, Isabel referred to me as an Afro-American. So just for those of you who are not from America, that is a very dated and violent term towards black people. You know? And when I wrote Isabel back and said I would not like to be referred to that way, and also suggested some better questions that more honored the work that I made. She was quite offended by that. And so I think as we think about this work that is being presented, which is very much about decolonization, we have to understand that folks who have been sort of under the boot of colonization must be given space to name themselves, their race and ethnicity, their gender identity, their sexual identity. They need to have the space to do that. And if you are offended by someone taking space to do that, then you could never be at the forefront of decolonial work. That is the antithesis of that. Because what that is, is I'm gonna name you. I'm going to control how you talk about your work and how your work is received. So I just wanted to name that and, and draw some accountability to that um, because I don't feel like I should have to hold that as I come into this conversation. So that's how I feel. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but also, I feel very happy to share space with you and talk to you. Thank you. So let's talk. Uh, so I'll, I'll do a little uh, curatorial framing around... Um, what Rashad is talking about, which actually is a 500-year-old conversation that really the first debate was the Valladolid debate in, I think, 1504. And that was about naming black people. And the discussion was whether um, it was about the indigenous people of Americas because slavery had not yet begun, but it was about whether we were even people, right? So the discussion was then not what type of people we were and what we could be named, but whether we even had personhood. And a lot of people don't appreciate in the decolonial work and in the legal strategies of uh, slavery was that black people were actually classified as objects under the law. So the importance of us being able to claim our own identities is really at the heart of the decolonial process. So having said that, uh, I'll ask my first question to Rashad, uh, which is um, being is a non-binary humanoid whose face is derived from the female faux mask, from the Chokwe people of Congo. Could you please speak about how you came to this presentation of them? Yeah, when I was creating the first generation of being, I was thinking a lot about, okay, what would a robot look like? And I was, being as a whole is like a real gesture towards a sort of post-race, post-gender futurity. And we don't 
know what an image like that looks like because we've been so much within what Bell Hooks calls the capitalist imperialist white supremacist patriarchy. And so when there's not a body for you in the world, when there's not an image for you in the world, what do you do? We resort to abstraction. And so when I was thinking about the history of abstraction, you know, uh, movements like cubism and surrealism, and uh, which are movements that show up in a lot of my more object-based work, um, I was thinking, well, where do these movements come from as we know it in the West? They come from Africa, from Europeans going to Africa, seeing what people were doing with their sculptural practices and applying that to painting surfaces. So I decided to go straight to the source. And so being looks that way, not because they are black, but more so because they are an abstract idea, so they must look like abstraction. Um, I love that particular mass because also that mass comes from a, a society that is uh, matriarchal, and it's a mass that's typically danced by a man to celebrate uh, women. And so I felt like there was a sort of um, queerness there as well. It could be seen as like an ancient form of drag, mm -hmm. if you will. And so I thought that would be a really um, great way for them to, to look, to spark a lot of conversation. Um, fabulous. Yeah. A second question. Uh, can you please talk to us about how you, come, you came to the design of their voice, their body, and their language? Yeah, and so their, um, their voice, I, I also wanted to really accentuate this whole idea of them being like not gendered. And so the voice is the synthesis of my voice mm -hmm. um, and also my studio manager's voice who's been working with me for like over 10, 10 years. And um, we got this sort of hybrid, uh, this sort of gender variant voice. Um, and then in terms of the, the body, um, it's based on you know several uh, cyborg models that have been really customized to create that particular physique. And I do acknowledge that if there is, um, a, because I, I, I want to address it because I feel like sometimes a critique will be like, oh, they have this sort of idealized body. And I don't think that that's not true, but for me, looking from a black gaze, mm -hmm. like when I think about the idealized black female body, it doesn't really look like being. Mm -hmm. Being is much more like, to me, a very non-binary um, body and so I wanted to make sure that they were sort of male and female but also were very athletic because they are a dancer more than anything else and so um, yeah that's how they yeah uh, uh, I would also like um, uh, in terms of like queer thinking um, you know really uh, in continental Europe gender really also became very ossified as part of the colonial process where women's bodies were used to hold land in the new world, whereas at the, at the time in most African societies, third gender was, gender was always a very fluid concept. So even when we're talking about uh, the history of queerness, the cultural history of queerness, we can look at your work of being and see it as a continuation of a broken history. So a sort of reparative stitch in the cultural history of African and Af African diasporic people. Um, so being was the central focus of your project assembly, which was extraordinary, and you can really get a sense of this if you look it up online. And that was held uh, at Park Avenue Armory earlier this year. And it functioned not only as an exhibition, uh, but also as a classroom and live performance space. Could you please talk about that environment, uh, especially, um, you know, the pedagogical um, aspects of being um, as, as, as it's related to your work and your thinking. Yeah, this space, um, when I was thinking about that, I, I mean, it, it needed to be multi-use, like a classroom, a dance space, and an exhibition space. But also, um, I was thinking a lot about the work that being would be doing in that space, because they were doing these decolonization classes like every other hour, every day. And so, um, because, you know, 
you know, setting up a class like that is a pretty big swing. You know, it's quite literally creating a space that is truly democratic, where everyone can speak, no one can say the wrong thing, and everyone is held accountable for what they say. Um, and so that was my way of kind of creating a space for us to like get through the ugliness, the clunkiness, mm -hmm. and get to a better space. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to create a space that would kind of facilitate that. And so I was thinking about um, sort of the um, hermeneutics of care and like how can I kind of incorporate that into like every aspect of the space. And so there's tons of theories around pattern being soothing. And so there's a pattern um, that I created that I use a lot in my collage work and the whole room was um, sort of covered in vinyl of that particular pattern. You can kind of see it on the screen above. Um, and then the um, walls were video mapped with um, computer animations that were derived from uh, fractal geometry, particularly fractal geometry that um, is found in uh, African hair braiding, African textiles, African architecture and sculpture. And I was using um, black bodies in a state of joy dancing to kind of create this uh, geometry. And I was using that geometry also because there was a lot of conversations around um, gender and gender variant people uh, in the work. And I felt like, you know, like, uh, fractals are something that, although they're quite scientific, there are things that occur in nature all the time, every day. You know, you see them in um, sea snail shells, you see it in the uh, ferns, you see it in branches, you see it in uh, snowflakes, and so there's something quite natural, and I was using that as an allegory to talk about, essentially say that everything that is has always been, and so like, you know, the folks that I'm addressing and trying to hold space for in this work are supposed to be here. There's something natural about them. So that was sort of something I was trying to communicate um, with those uh, animated environments. And then, um, and then the classroom was just like, uh, I tried to give a, a very large space so we can touch as many people um, as possible. And then just beyond the space where the classroom was, which you see there, just behind it, um, was where the more object-based exhibition was. And a lot of the images in that work were images I had taken of um, black folks mm -hmm. in my community. Um, and then also they were kind of spliced together with um, images of you know African sculptures or masks that are often used in rituals to kind of call upon the ancestral ancestors to sort of help people who are going through something. And so I was thinking a lot about this whole idea of like images of bodies currently under siege spliced together with objects that can aid those bodies through connecting with the spirit realm. And so is it possible that those objects showing up in the work can not only aid the body that's a part of the picture, but also the body standing in front of it? So everywhere you looked, I was trying to sort of create some sense of care and the soundscape, which um, a lot of you may have heard if you've seen the piece, was created um, in my lab at um, the Stanford Institute for Human Centered Artificial Intelligence, where we did a survey with 80 black folks to uh, see what folks considered to be culturally specific sounds that were soothing. Mm -hmm. So things like grease popping, you know, 808 bass drums, like uh, singing, all these different things came out of the data. And what was really interesting is that it was sort of like, unanimous on, like certain things were unanimous. And so I worked with my buddy Robert Lowe and we created um, this sound uh, scape that ran behind being as they uh, read their poetry. Um, so, you know, when you're in the space, you're either hearing being read poetry or you're um, essentially sitting in on the class. Mm -hmm. And so there's always some sort of, sort of soothing element mm -hmm. supporting being through this work and audience as they come in. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that's just so absolutely thoughtful is I did a project where um, we asked people who live in uh, social housing mm -hmm. and we were talking about sounds that people found soothing and one of the things in, in art galleries you often find trickling water or the sound of a fountain which 
in, uh, for, for middle class people is a soothing sound, but one of uh, the, fee in the feedback we got was that when you live in social housing, the sound of trickling water sends you into a state of fear because it means you have a leak. <laughs> and so bringing up this, uh, this concept which I've been thinking about uh, in terms of substrate neutrality of what may be soothing for one person is a space of terror for another person. And so the fact that you had involved your community even at this level becomes such a, a, a caring and important part of your work. And I'd just like to highlight that about your practice and um, just to thank you for thinking about um, all of these important details. Um, I'll ask my last question, uh, which is, what did you discover from being after this presentation? And what are your future hopes for being? Um, well, one thing, I discovered a lot of things, but I think the most salient thing I discovered was um, when I would come to the armory and just sort of like hide in the back and watch people as they took the class, I found that um, there's something about being um, that was very disarming because they are, you know, they're a robot. And so they essentially sort of become a mirror for whatever people need to see. Mm -hmm. um, they start the class by saying, I'm a two-year-old artificial intelligence, da, da 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 And so there's a way in which they immediately come into conversation with you and you know that they are a child. Mm -hmm. And so a child is somewhat less threatening. Mm -hmm. um, I imbued them with a lot of humor mm -hmm. and they're, you know, kind of rambunctious too. Mm -hmm. And so they're, there is like sort of something like quite cute about mm -hmm. them and that's very disarming for mm -hmm. people. And mm -hmm. I think just all of those other things sort of supporting that mm -hmm. really sort of disarmed people because, you know, myself and the Armory, we were sort of like, okay, well, how is this gonna work out? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as part in the class, I should also say the version that's here is a video version of that class. That class is an interactive class where you do get to talk to being in real time, every class member. Um, and so, in the, in the actual class, you know, there's a moment where being asks all the participants to get into breakout groups and talk about how capitalism, imperialism, white supremacy, and patriarchy show up in their lives and what's one action step they can take today to start to liberate themselves from that apparatus of oppression. And then when people come back, they talk about how that shows up in their life, mm -hmm. what they want to start to do to liberate themselves, and being gives them sort of like affirming and encouraging ways to go about um, doing that. And I found that people were really vulnerable. And you know, when you create a truly democratic space like that, that can be tricky because you're, at, you know, this is in New York and the Upper East Side. So you're at any given time, you could have a white cishet male. 60s talking to a black and Latinx gender variant person from East Flatbush, <laughs> right. you know? And so, and they're talking about race, they're talking about mm -hmm. gender, they're talking about class. Like the things that people just don't talk about because they're too afraid of saying the wrong thing. And so I found that people really uh, opened themselves up and there were all these incredible generative Con uh, conversations that happen. And it's sort of revealed what is possible when people truly come together mm -hmm. um, with um, healing at the front of mind. You know? um, so I'm going to end our wonderful conversation here. I'd just like uh, to talk about the wonderfulness of play and the playfulness of being and and link that to actually a slave strategy where we, we used um, as someone from the chattel descendant we use humor as a way to have conversations and difficult conversations uh, layered in humor so that we could have uh, these conversations and have conversations with our masters. So black humor is in itself 
um, a strategy against oppression and just to see these strategies from our ancestors being deployed in your work in such a beautiful way and bringing it into the now is such a pleasure and privilege to have this conversation and to be able to unpick and talk about these ideas with you, Rashad. So thank you very much. And now we'll give the stage to Isabel who will continue the discussion uh, with the other um, award winners of distinction. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Helen and Rashad. Uh, we only see each other when we are working. Please stay here. Um, now it's our turn again. Uh, but also thank you for sharing uh, this discussion with us. And now I welcome Isabel. Um, Aver, she's a graduate of the Political Sciences Institute and a Master in Management of Cultural Projects. Isabel specialized in new media in the early 90s and she's a pioneer in the field of game art in France. Very welcome and thank you so much for taking your time for being here with us in the second part of this panel. And being destroyed in public. Thank you. Um, so... Um, Thank you for your introduction, and um, I would like to start with the um, um, word of distinction and uh, to introduce you to Marc Erichet. Hello, Marc. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> How are you? Good. I'm fine. I'm you. Great. Uh -huh. <laughs> so can we uh, just, uh, could you just introduce you and also a little bit uh, uh, your work, uh, Absence? Yes, uh, we, can we, uh, uh, for, uh, déjà, um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, to the event. On uh, We can launch uh, a short video uh, before uh, it's, it's launched. the film. It's launched. Okay. It's already ah. launched, yes. Okay. So uh, I uh, introduce him uh, just uh, after. Mm. So it's on the screen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, Please tell us about you and. So I I, I introduce the project, Ara. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Alors, uh, I'm Mac and uh, I'm a French director uh, on on three D sculpture. Uh, Absence uh, is a film uh, that questions the media treatment of the homeless people. Um, this project starts when I uh, heard on the news TV that we're talking about homeless people and I knew exactly what they were going to say. So um, I questioned myself about this. The problem is the homeless is winter is a subject that come, ev that come up every winter from the moment uh, the temperature drop below zero degree. So, um, in France, we call it a chestnut tree, uh, donc un marronnier médiatique. Uh, this is an information that comes uh, up every year at the same time mm -hmm. in France. The number of homeless has doubled in 10 years. So the question is, uh, what is the use of the media in their information does not change anything in our society? <laughs> And um, I want to say too, um, in the film there is a sound montage of television news archive. So I did a lot of research of media archive. Uh, at one point I look at the history of uh, temperatures for 20 years. I noted the dates, then looked at the archive of the TV news for each of these dates. And the result is incredibly predicable. The temperature below uh, zero equal the homeless is in, in winter uh, every year. Uh, yet the homeless uh, die all year round. Hmm. Um, I also realized uh, that the journalists, and especially the mainstream media, uh, never questioned the cause uh, of the increase uh, of this increase in the number of the homeless people. Uh, this media treatment prevents us understanding and finding strong political solution. Finally, at some point, uh, it's, uh, it's a film that talks about uh, all of us facing the homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing question about all the relationships uh, the media. Right. Hmm. Uh. 
Thank you. And actually, uh, could we talk about the figure of the political and social body uh, in absence? Uh, it's a very good question. Um, I think uh, that the figure of the body politic that Shang wrote in my film show a difference between those who form the opinion and the people. Uh, at the beginning of the film, I show above all the people are dislocated and that they have a trouble helping uh, the old men. Uh, because these people no longer form a body, I think. Uh, I think uh, these form the one body are uh, the one who hold the power. Uh, the body politic is a concept of Hobbes. Uh, for him, uh, for him, the, um, the state form a body because it's maintained by a powerful sovereign. In my film, journalists, politicians, and experts merge into a single entity because they form a political body. Uh, I have already called this sequence the Leviathan uh, in reference to us. On the other hand, we realize that this power dislocated the different social classes, raises and bringing them together. <laughs> And actually, um, it's not so common, uh, the idea of social and political dimension in the animation world in France. Uh, would you like to comment that? Uh, yes, um, it, uh, it's true uh, that there are less political film in animation than in live action film. Uh, the question is uh, why directors uh, show the medium of animation? Uh, I think um, animation, um, Normally, the animation is a fantastic field of uh, fantasy and expressionism uh, expression. And it's normal for animated film directors to favor things that uh, raise the imaginary. Uh, on the other hand, uh, today we have uh, more and more projects around feminism and ecology. Uh, this subject emerged uh, from an omerta in France. Uh, but it's true, the subject on the social classes have been much less present in France uh, for mm. 40 years. It's not a good news, but I think uh, it can uh, be uh, new uh, for the future. So it slightly uh, changes. Uh, this dimension, is it a, an aspect that is usually present in your work? Uh... Um, yes, uh, this, is, this is the first time uh, that I have uh, really worked on the political uh, subject. <laughs> Before I was a dealt uh, with more universalist uh, philosophical subject, uh, such as uh, what is reality, uh, is the human as, de as determined machine. Uh, I start to take an interest in political philosophy uh, six or seven years ago because I think I was concerned by, concerned by the atmosphere of revolt in France. Uh, for six years ago, uh, there is a big uh, atmosphere of revolt uh, <laughs> in our uh, country. So I think uh, that today I would find uh, it difficult to not, uh, to no longer refer to political notion in my work. I uh, it totally changed my vision of uh, human relationship. Mm. And also, I would like to ask you um, um, this question about the link between sculpture and your work in animation? Uh, yes, there is a, a big link uh, between uh, the, the, the two. Um, in 3D, there are many ways to create shape. Uh, and the one I prefer is uh, digital sculpting. Uh, it's a chat sculpting in 3D software with what you check tablet. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's like um, clay sculpture, but uh, on uh, the computer. Uh, this, um, excuse me. Uh, I stage my film like animated sculpture. Uh, since I use the digital sculpting process, I uh, a lot of. Um, since I use the digital sculpting process, sorry. <laughs> A lot for animation and stage animated sculpture, animated sculpture. Uh, naturally, I start using 3D printing to make real tangible sculpture. Uh, 
but uh, my uh, 3D print uh, sculpture work is really a continuation of my animation work. I think it's the, the same, uh, the same uh, thing. Tell me, tell me in French. Uh, je pense que c'est le, les mêmes thèmes. The, the, the same, the same themes. Mm. Okay. Mm. <laughs> And do you intend to exhibit this animation with a 3D sculpture, or it's not a project? Uh, I have, I have uh, one event uh, in a gallery uh, in, uh, in Tours in France. There was, there were uh, with um, my 3D sculpture and my animation film. And um, I don't know to say that it's a printing. Uh, like a photography, I, I make um, some uh, image in 3D uh, that I print in uh, in 2D uh, uh, on a Libon. En fait. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much, Mark. And uh, <laughs> thank you for this really uh, wow, amazing uh, animation. Thank you. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you to you, ma. Thank you, Isabel. <laughs> <laughs> and now I would like to welcome uh, Yoriko uh, Mitsushiri. Uh, hello. Who is also oh, Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. Um, who is also an award of distinction uh, with uh, her film uh, Anxious Body. So. Um, Would you like to introduce yourself and uh, and your work, please? Yes. My animation is, in a word, a contemporary thing. So, if I summarize my work, it means all about the feelings, the touch. と体の一部のパーツだったりとか、あとはよく日常で目にするような身近なものをモチーフにして、その形、感触とか動きにフォーカスしてアニメーションにしています。I focus on motifs such as part of the bodies and ordinary objects that we often see to make an animation. その動きは主にゆったりとした動きとか、柔らかさとか、伸縮による気持ちよさ。もう多いですし、あとは通覚を刺激するような感覚とか、そういう見ている人の身体感覚に訴えかけることを意識して制作しています。So when creating, I'm paying attention to the aspect of delivering physical sense of the viewer, such as pleasant feeling of softness and elasticity through the slow movements, or even sometimes the feeling of stimulating sense of pain through the screen. はい、で今あのスクリーンに映っているのは今回あの受賞いただいた、まあ、賞をいただいた「不安な体」という作品のトレーラーになるんですけれどもこの作品も感触的な表現にフォーカスした作品です。So the anxious body that I was given the, uh, uh, the award this time also focuses on the sensual expression and the physicality. と最初のセロハンテープを指で引っ張ってであの切るっていう動きがあるんですけどその時の感覚から始まってあのその質感とか形とか伝わる感触がさまざまなあのベクトルに向かって展開していくものです。So, in the beginning of the video, there is a scene where the cellophane tape is hold and pull and cut. So, this is also a, a, a way of transmitting the touch. And then, after that, it, the animation is expanded into a different direction. It is important to me not to include the clear meaning of stories in the work. But rather have this、uh, tactile animation、um, so the audience can feel more immersive to this experience.、はい、で私はあのやっぱり感触的なアニメーションに浸見る人が浸ってもらいたいっていう思いが一番にあるのでその私がその作品に明確な意味とかストーリーを込めないで。作るっていうことは私にとっては重要なことです
The most important thing for me is for the viewers to be immersed into the animation itself. So it's rather important for me to take out the elements of narrative and sentimentali sentimentality uh, to achieve this intention of mine. So in that sense, I think this work is kind of tingles the body of the audience, each an individual bodies, and it brings out a new sensation to each and one of them. So that was about my work. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I I would like to, to ask you, your work is very sensual and sometimes very physically disturbing uh, sometimes. How do you consider this body-to-body -body relationship through the screen with the audience? Hi. えっと、そうですね。これ私はその画面通して見る人の体の中に何か反応が起こるっていうことが一番重要。そこに意義があるのかなと思って制作しています。So So I think the most important thing for me is to see how the screen activates a reaction from the human. And that's why I think the types of work that I create is unique and meaningful. I agree. I agree. Yes,ka.同意します。続けてください。はい。え、体っていうのはやっぱりいろんなものを記憶しているので、そのこの肉体が物体としてすごい面白いと思っていて。I think the body memorizes more things in ourselves, and I am very amazed by the flesh as a substance. So I think uh, so what I, what I'm intending is to poke the memories of the body rather than the memories that we have in our brains. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it really comes with my next question because... So uh, oh, excuse me. Oh, please go on. No, sorry, I was just uh, translating uh, to Yoriko, so I'll be muted. Please continue, Isabel, thank you. Ah, okay. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, in anxious body, the, the image becomes uh, almost physical. How did you work in this tactile uh, animation? Yes, I think the image is used to be able to understand the image. Basically, the object とか感覚っていうのは、多くの人にとっても身近であったり、日常的に体験したことがあるような身近なものが多いです。So, for transmitting the image or the sensuality, per se, I incorporate the motifs of familiar objects and experiences, hypothetically to most people who are viewing this work. で、so in the process of creation, it was about distorting the animation spatially and sensually by drawing objects that exist in reality, 
but at the same time, objects that do not exist in reality, such as triangles and lines. And by intersecting them, it creates a very strange atmosphere so that it kind of has a, like a mix and match, but still familiar and a little bit of strangeness incorporated. So, you yoga must take an image in your team, you're still in it, just to start or you are going to go and he got a regard you know, I know. By this mixture, there is a hint of incongruity or this like a hunch that's involved. So that is one of the tips in the process of creation and in the final version of the creation. Uh, in your previous uh, trilogy of uh, animation, you said that you were working on sensations and the succession of sensation. Is it also the case uh, with the anxious body? Yes. In the past, the third book, the third book, the third book, is the theme of feeling and feeling and feeling and feeling and feeling and feeling and feeling. So the previous three works that I've made before Anxious Body was composed with a vision by interlocking feelings and sense. So it was about going back and forth between these two. So it was about going back and forth between these two. So it was about going back and forth between these two. So it was about going back and forth between these two. So it was about going back and forth between these two. So I actually like this composing method as a way to manifest sensual animation as a visual artwork, connecting from sensual animation to visual artwork. はい、その構成方法を考えるっていうことは私にとってとても重要なことで、その感触的なアニメーションを私はあの一番の目的としてあの、作りたいんだけれども、それを一本の映像として成立させるにはどうしたらいいかということをいつも考えています。so the, the, what I'm always thinking is about the method of bridging between these sensual clips of animation to become a full-length visual work. And especially because I still want to deliver this sensual feeling or touch to the audience, this becomes one of the core aspects of my thought process. Hmm. そういうあの方法で作ることもできるかもしれないんですけれどもそうすると多分見てる人っていうのはそちらの方に意識がいってしまってアニメーションの動きにあの集中してみるっていうことがちょっと薄れてしまうんじゃないかなと思っています。So, of course, there could be a way to bring in stories, narratives, and sentimental meanings, but the audience attention will be focused more on those aspects rather than the animative movements itself. So that's why I try to create or think about unique methods that will still bring together the sensual animations to um, a visual art, but also remain the sensualities. Okay. なのでその最も重要な感触的な表現以外の要素はできるだけあの取り除きつつ作品として成立させるための独,独自の作品独自の構成方法を考えることが一番重要だと思っています。So again, I think it's most important for me to think about of a unique method that establishes the work while taking out the elements that are not related to the most important sensual expressions. はい、なので前作までのその感触と感覚を連鎖させるっていう方法はもう3作作ってあのまあやり尽くしたみたいなことがあったので,でなのでもうちょっとそのもっと感覚感触にフォーカスしたやり方はないかなっていうふうに考えてちょっとそれを模索しながら作ったのが今回の作品です。So I actually felt like I've done all, done most of the things I can do regarding 
chaining between the feelings and the sense in my previous three works. So this artwork that has that we are seeing today, that's electronica, is something that was more uh, investigative or uh, exploratory uh, in a sense that I wanted to make a new method that can focus on feelings and touch. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, where does this anxiety come from? Uh, what their relationship with the, the period uh, of its production? えっと、この作品の意味の中の不安の意味っていうのは、元から体に備わってる機能としての不安っていうイメージで。もう不確実なものとか、違和感を感じるときに体は不安を覚えるので、そういう体にとっての、とっての不安、普遍的なものとしての不安という要素を入れてみました。So when one feels something uncertain or discomforting, the body becomes anxious. So I wanted to include the element of anxiety as one original function, embedded function of the body, and also as a universal something for the body. So that was my uh, main intention. はい。制作時期はあのパンデミックとあの被っていたんですが、作品の構想はもっと前にしていたので、パンデミックとの直接的な関連はないですね。so although I did create it uh, while pandemic, the idea itself, the concept itself existed from before, so I wouldn't say it has a direct connection to the time that it was being created. Thank you. Thank you very much. For, I really enjoyed the anxious body. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, Sarah, do we have uh, time for questions uh, for that, the audience? That, 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 that. That was uh, my microphone, which is uh, probably working. So thank you so much for taking your time. Also, merci beaucoup and domo arigato gozaimashita. I'm looking into the audience if there is any questions. Um, we would have a microphone for you to our two panelists. You see, we have a lot going on. It's a coming and going, and it's already this day where there's uh, uh, planes to catch. And what I really enjoyed was, um, because when you started... Um, um, you explained that it's about the memory of feeling and you know even seeing this animation um, coming from digital community category of course but I could feel it so my brain remembered somehow what this feeling might be and this was really uh, fascinating uh, for, for me to see uh, so I'm looking into the audience questions anyone this is your chance mm -hmm. so, as long as the um, Zoom, I think it is, as long as Zoom is working or the internet is stable, <laughs> I would take it. So I guess everyone's happy now. Isabel, you asked all the questions, it seems. So uh, <laughs> once again, thank you so much for having taken your time. Isabel, we will see each other again for the jury's uh, recap. We are going into a little break. And if you look at the man who is sitting uh, over there, it's Juan Carlos, he's the... The host, yeah, hi. <laughs> he will be your next host for the, um, for the next category after the break, where we'll be happy to welcome you again. Have a nice time. Thank and thank you, you so much, much Isabel. Thank you.
からダメそこに電波を使う中にケーブルが入ってた。
welcome back. We hope you enjoyed your break. In case you just dropped by, we are happy uh, you're here, of course, um, at our wrap-up session to reflect on this year's Ars Electronica Festival and to talk to artists and researchers as well as jury members of the pre-forums about their impressions and insights. Um, which leads me directly to the category that comes up next, which is Interactive Art Plus and the host, Jose Carlos Mariategui. He's a writer, curator and entrepreneur on culture and technology. And I'm happy that you're here. <laughs> well, he has a lot going on. I can go on, Jose Carlos, it's no problem. Um, so he studied biology and received his BSc in applied mathematics, holds both masters and doctoral degrees in information systems and innovation from the London School of Economics and Political Science. And he's also the founder of Alta Technologic Te Technologi here, see, that's why I need you here by my side, come here. The Alta Tecnologia Andina, a project devoted to creativity, technology, and innovation in Latin America. And you are a jury member, of course, and you're going to host the next panel, and I'm very excited about it. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, first, I'll, I'll make a short introduction, um, and uh, I want first, first of all, thank uh, everybody at Ars Electronica, the team, uh, for such a marvelous festival. And it was already mentioned, there were thousands, 2,000 plus artistic projects from 88 countries. And, and as we already saw, there is an impressive data from pre house Electronica, which is fantastic. Uh, as part of the Interactive Plus, we had 928 submissions. Uh, therefore, it was quite challenging. Um, and I want to thank uh, also the team once more Crystal, Emiko, Martin, Laura, for building such an impressive data-driven platform, which was very useful for us because there are certain topics today that cannot be overlooked. Um, there are, I mean, aspects like gender, regional diversity, and um, that is very useful when you have uh, so much information available. Uh, and of course, it's also important to say that we also need to thank ARTS to, for setting up the exhibition. Because, as you may understand, one thing is to select works and the other thing is to put them in the space. And there are so many challenges that come from that. So now, now to the topic. I, I thought I'm, I'm because I'm, I'm chairing this panel, I am also talking on behalf of my fellow um, uh, jury members. Uh, Don Choi, uh, Rashin uh, Fadaye, Ririni Papadimitriou, and Yusi and Jesleva. Um, I, I must say that during the, the, the meetings, we faced several questions. We, we asked ourselves many questions. Perhaps the, the, the main one was, was, what's the meaning of interactivity and art at times of turbulence, violence, constant state of turmoil, fear, intolerance, ongoing endemic wars, injustice, abuse of power. So what, what, what can art really do uh, when the world is in crisis, as it is right now? So, yeah, we are under a deep, a deep crisis, uh, and, and this is definitely undermining our cultural identity, our history, memory, of course, climate change, environment. But in addition, as a result of the pandemic, of two years of pandemic, we have not only become more aware of the significance and consequences of digital technologies uh, in our everyday lives, but, but also of a world that is prevalent with social inequalities in which xenophobia, homophobia, transphobia, I mean, if, if, if we were hearing also at the uh, animation uh, pre a uh, while ago, and I think some of these topics, also discrimination, are prevailing. So we wanted to stretch the uh, plus from the interactive plus category and take the opportunity to prioritize and showcase works that reflect and respond to these critical issues and most importantly, works that represent per a perspective of inclusiveness that is so necessary, so urgent now. There is also an important thing to say. Uh, many of the submissions were from people, from people that were under 30s who draw their practice from new emerging processes, not just from artworks, but art practices, art processes. So this means that they built on innovative forms of knowledge, diverse forms of global collaboration, and enable new spaces for human equality, questioning some of our narrow views 
uh, around different topics. I don't know, gender bias, and, and, and especially driven by curiosity to act differently. Uh, the works we are going to discuss in a moment, and I'm going to invite in a moment the, the, the winners, um, demonstrate the importance of revealing aspects that are commonly hidden or that are seldom uh, reachable or understandable. I mean, aspects that we usually take for granted or ignore, like wind, speed, ancestral knowledge, different types of, 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 of knowledge, indigenous knowledge, uh, bacteria behavior, elements highlighted by the artists uh, to build a new consciousness or to incorporate them into a new consciousness. And those elements can turn around rigid ways of thinking and open up new perspective in understanding and building our world against these reductionist narratives while activating global solidarity through bridging together communities and enabling new ways and spaces for activism or new ways of activism. So perhaps um, it's, it's important to say also that we thought that the interactive art should reflect then on how new technologies are enabling new forms of empowerment, in particular in underrepresented and, and less visible groups, in a way that not only represents uh, and highlights human life, but also brings to the front other forms of life and matter, the invisible lives and matter, forms that are historically being silenced, uh, overshadowed, or pushed aside. So the others are not just um, the, the human others, but also the, the material others. Um, and it's very important to, to say also, and, and coming from Peru, um, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy to say that the number of voices that were selected come from all over the world, not, I mean, across the world, the south, the north, and this is very important. Uh, it, 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 it's very different to talk about diversity as an individual working and living in the north, uh, and thinking that the world should follow certain paths without taking into account not only the voices of other groups, but also their pioneering re research um, and some pioneering developments, which we, which we usually, I mean, it, they are usually hidden. So, um, I mean, just to wrap up, um, I think we need to converge at a critical discussion point on topics that affect us all. So this is a call for new forms of, of empowerment or uh, as we mentioned in the jury, in the title, uh, a call for a radical consciousness. And, and, and I want to, uh, uh, before inviting uh, the winners, I, I, want, I want also to mention that um, it's, uh, it's, if, if you have a moment, it will be useful that you take a look at the, at the um, texts that are in the cyber art uh, book. It's available online, but also you can read it, um, uh, you can buy the book. I mean, it's better for your health. I mean. It's, it's proven that it's better uh, uh, that to read in, in paper than, than digitally, so it's also going to be a healthy thing to do. Uh, and I, I wanted to stress that because, I mean, I think there is so much effort put by the Arts Electronica team and by the jury members to write those texts thoughtfully that they are a source of, of knowledge. So, so now I would like to introduce um, uh, the winners, please, if you can come uh, forward to the stage. Uh, yes, Natalia, uh, Jung, Christian, uh, Yuriko, Tega, and Sam. Okay, so let's, let's start. We're going to sit down. Let's start uh, with, uh, with the winners of, of the Golden Nika, with, with uh, Jung and Natalia. Um, perhaps it would be first good to know a little bit about the project, if you, can, if you can tell us also. We know that, I mean, you both work on the project online, you didn't knew each other personally, and you are both students. So, I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about the project? Sure. Um, <clears throat> our project name calls biofilm.net. And why is biofilm? Because you can see in the image, you see a yellow umbrella. And obviously, it's a symbolic um, object from Hong Kong movement. But why biofilm? Why we choose these words? 
Um, biofilm is a bacteria behavior or technologies when they living inside our body or inside um, like a natural environment. When they facing some difficulties or serious situations, they will create this surface like um, like a shelter for them. And the amazing part is there is not only one single species of bacteria to do this. They are there are multi-species. There are cross, cross um, different bacteria to do it without any like uh, leaders or any like centralized centralized communication. They just create this surface to protect them, and to then them became um, one thousand stronger to to against or resist under the like immune system, antibiotics or other species attacked, and. We put this metaphor to our project because um, the umbrellas also uh, become a covering or protecting object in the protest because um, in many uh, modern protest, protest, people not only protect their physical bodies but also protect their identities. We are avoiding this CCTV monitoring or censorship. So we wish this object this um, biofilm can um, become uh, like a, how to say, like a shelter for these communities. And under this biofilm, people can not only protect themselves, they can communicate with each other. So this is not only a, uh, like an object, but also it's a communities, communities communication applications. And Maybe Natalia can talk about more. Yeah, maybe uh, we would like to share a short video with you and then I can tell you also a bit more. This is one short part of uh, the video that we submitted to the, to the festival. Uh, and what we want to talk about in this point is how important it is to understand uh, something that Carlos was sharing in the introduction, that it is about the process and about how to co-create together with the communities with this, let's say, situated knowledge and situated processes that will bring um, to reflect on how we can connect, how we can um, build new kinds of technologies that get a bit closer to life-like behavior. Uh, and for us, this was the idea also during the, during the festival. And what we did to build the project is that we don't want to build some kind of a product. It's not a service that can be implemented or so, and so on. But the way we build the, pro the project is through co-creation workshops. And we did two of them in, in Bogota with two different communities, one of them Mutante, which is an art and science community, and the other one we did in the anarchist book fair, La Furia. And what we did there and what we realized during the conversations that we had also the chance to have here uh, is that this is, it, it is not about giving in one direction the technology to solve a problem. This is not the approach that there is a problem and there is a solution and technology will solve it and so on, but it's about um, realizing and doing an homage to the real networks that are behind the protests and that are behind the resistance processes that we, are, that we were experiencing and that we are experiencing now uh, all around the globe. And these networks behind, uh, under this biofilm are based on collaboration and are based on uh, communitarian processes that allow us to take care of each other and to co-create together the possibilities of what we actually want to have um, in, in the future or no, in the present <laughs> that will become some way in the future, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, let's now go to one of the uh, awards of distinction uh, to Christian Avila uh, and Yuriko um, and the work The Eternal Return for Hispanic Interactions. How, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about it, how the idea was developed? I mean, it was, uh, it was 
partly develop or was developed as part of an award. Can you tell us a little bit more about that process? Okay, thank you. Um, el eterno retorno, uh, for now on the eternal return, pre Hispanic interaction, is a piece conceived for the public space with the support of the Museum of Art of Lima, Mali, and Telefonica Foundation from Peru. The initial idea uh, was built around the conception for the public space as a construction where everybody lives together in equal uh, conditions. For that representation, we wanted to have a piece from different sources, regional museums, private collections, and big museums. In that way, uh, the collection piece uh, will, will share, no matter where they come from, the same space without difference. This plan of global collaboration between museums was affected for the pandemic because this institution, as cultural guardians, stopped working, uh, showing how fragile our structure could be. Something particular happens with the wind sound pieces in comparison with other historical cultural artifacts. They just need to be blown so, so they can work again. But who should blow them? Who is the character who has the right of playing this instrument? These instruments that are still a mystery to us in many ways, because there aren't partitures or historical records that indicate how they were used or uh, what melody they produce. I will uh, have a, a guesswork. Over this un uncertainty, we chose the wind, the wind with its particularities. Chaos and freedom plays for us with the help of sensors, Arduino, and relays, the sounds that it choose do to have us, to give us. But what would the performer do with, without the instrument? There was a brief collaboration of the Javier Parado Clinic to make possible the medical procedure to the original pieces, some of them even a thousand years old. We could take a look at, in the, at their interiors and the technology used to generate the sound. With this valuable information, we obtain a printable archive, very near to original so we can have a dependable sound, the closest possible to the real sound of original pieces. I like to think this is a not closed and conclusion installation. I'm looking forward to make it uh, grow with the collaboration of museums uh, that have pre-Hispanic wine instruments, is in collection, so in, in that way we can return some lost sound to people as a way to recompose a shared memory. I'm so also grateful because this trip made us hear what the wind of, of Linz has to say using the language of all Peruvian sound instruments. And that's a uh, new interaction. Mm, we, we, we prepared a short video that we would like to show. Thank you so much, Christian and Yuriko. Now, let's go to the um, second uh, award of distinction, which was a work perfect uh, sleep.
from Tega Brain and uh, Sam Levine. Um, you, you pick up into something that is uh, so relevant today in, in our contemporary 24-hour society, which is sleep, no? I mean, or lack of sleep. Um, the, the, I mean, and, and, and we know of, the, of, the, of all the problems, um, the health issues, uh, I mean, with regards to the cardiovascular mobility, um, increase in diabetes, obesity. Uh, how did you thought about uh, developing this, this, this project? Tell us a little bit. Yeah, sure. So we actually have a few, uh, also a few slides um, you, could, you could put up. If they're there. Or not. I'll wait. I'll wait like I'll wait like four more seconds. Oh yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah. So so perfect sleep is a it's a project about uh, you know exploring this relationship between uh, sleep, uh, capitalism, and climate change, and uh, it's manifested in, in sort of two parts. Uh, one uh, one part is a is an app. It's on the uh, iPhone uh, app store uh, called the Perfect Sleep app, and what it lets you do is set. <clears throat> set a schedule for yourself so that uh, it adds one minute to your sleeping time every night uh, over the course of three years until you achieve what we call a state of perfect sleep or 24 hours of, of sleeping. Um, and as it's sort of doing this, as it's like adding time to your, uh, uh, to your, to your sleep, it's also subtracting time first from, uh, well, in a suggested way, first from the amount of time that you work and then when sort of the work hours hit zero, uh, eventually it starts uh, subtracting from your leisure and then eventually you get to, you get to nothing, you get to zero. Um, as you're um, falling asleep, we've also provided a set of what we call sleep aids or dreamscapes. Um, and maybe TV, you can, you can talk about that a second. We could go to the next slide also, thank you. Um, hello, is this working? Oh, yes, this is working, okay. So, yeah, as Sam mentioned, in the app there's four dream incubation soundscapes um, and we invited four of our favourite sort of writers to write some texts that the brief we gave them was text to seed people's dreams and help them imagine a world that's different to our own. Um, so we were also thinking about, you know, how do you make a work that you can sort of experience in that moment between being awake and being asleep. And so these uh, texts were then set to music and they're these sort of very dreamy, lovely um, sound, um, soundscapes that were composed by um, a New York composer, Luisa Pereira. And the texts are by Sophie Lewis, Holly Jean Buck, um, Simone Brown and jo Johanna Hedva. <laughs> um, and so they're available on the app and then also in the installation which you see up on the screen. Um, so in the installation version of the work, the, the dreamscapes are sort of embedded in these daybeds and we took inspiration for the design of the daybeds from um, the novel Magic Mountain, the sort of um, reclining chairs in that novel and also the, the sleeping pods of Silicon Valley. So obviously like um, there's been a lot of sort of apps and technologies that are sort of trying to optimise people's sleep schedules. Um, but we really were wanting to respond to these, um, these sort of interventions, which are trying to kind of optimize sleep so that for one's productivity, right, to make one a better worker, to make one contribute to the economy um, more effectively. And so in, in, in response to that, we actually wanted to sort of really question what productivity is and what how um, we divide our time and point to the sort of arbitrary division of like eight hours sleep, eight hours work and eight hours leisure and, you know, argue that it could actually be different. Maybe just go to the, ne the next slide again. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so, um, oh, this one has a cool background. Okay, so um, we also sort of produced this, uh, I would say, ex extremely crude uh, climate model that uh, uses uh, sleep uh, as a proxy for GDP and GDP as a proxy for uh, emissions. So as you are uh, sleeping more and more and uh, working less and less and also leisuring less and less, you can sort of track uh, what your contribution to GDP would be and then, and then what, your, what your contribution to emissions would be. Um, 
And I had something else I was supposed to say on this slide, but I just completely forgot what it was. So maybe you well, just, just to conclude, I mean, the project is really trying to do a reframing of geoengineering, right? So what if we thought about sleep and rest and how we kind of design our days as a potential way that we could address the climate emergency? Um, also really responding to discourse around geoengineering and a lot of geoengineering initiatives which sort of frame... Um, the, these initiatives are sort of efforts to sort of uh, modify the biophysical world so that the status quo can continue, so that our economies can continue. And so we really wanted to think about like what it would mean to sort of um, re-engineer our lives and, and think about the ways that we could address climate through, through um, culture and, and economics as well. Fantastic, thanks. thanks for that. We will um, go back to you because I think there are some interesting uh, questions and issues that you already mentioned. I, I wanted to ask uh, something to uh, Natalia and, and Jung. You come from both from very different realities. I mean, seems to. I mean, Jung, you come from Taiwan. Natalia, you come from Colombia. Uh, uh, not only different countries, different continents. However, I mean, how did your local contexts enrich um, each other's point of view in order to develop the project? Especially once, once more, you were working online. Yeah, and I think that working online was something good for that because we had the chance to be to remain connected to the social context and the uh, processes that were happening there at that time. And in Colombia, when when the protests started in 2019, that was regarding the a government that was increasing social inequality even more in Colombia. Um, and when the lockdown started, everything had to stop abruptly, right? Uh, but we knew that we had a lot of energy that at some point will come out again. Uh, and also the restrictions of the pandemic make it, made it even worse. And um, um, at some point, uh, the people suffered so much that they were not more afraid and this was kind of a a motto for the protest that we, the, we are more afraid of the government than the virus, right? So we have to go to the streets again. And we suffer a lot of uh, repression when this kind of, for me, the demonstrations and the protests are an expression of life. You know, like we want to be alive. We want to have the opportunity to behave like living organisms. Uh, and because the institutions and the government is afraid of so much life that cannot be controlled, that cannot be governed in the way they want to, uh, they just uh, go to oppression techniques. Uh, to, and, and we had to suffer a lot of that. Actually, mm, two, two days ago, the 9th of September, uh, was two years of a massacre of the police in Bogota, where 13, 13 people were murdered just because uh, they went out to protest against the police abuse uh, because the police killed uh, Javier Ordonez the night before just because he was outside on the streets during the pandemic restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the kind of things that we were suffering there and the kind of things that made us think we have to come together, you know? And what happened in the protests be behind, again, this biofilm was that a lot of arts were expressed. A lot of arts were, you, um, were our way to express what we wanted to do and to go to the streets with music, like a carnival of arts. And, and so among all of these things, among all of these encounters, we were sharing our interest on microorganisms and politics. And we got together to talk about it and Maybe I would love that you share a bit also from Hong Kong. Yeah, for sure. It's like um, when we talk about this uh, from microorganisms to social movements and also some technologist pers 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 perspective, for me it's so um, like a shock or in, like curious about because since 2019, the Hong Kong movement strategy called Be Water is kind of influenced around the world. It's like from Hong Kong, you can see the same strategy people use in like Southeast Asia. Also in states also, you can see people wearing all black masks and umbrellas. And I heard Natalia mentioned that it's also influenced from um, uh, Colombia, in, from Chile and then Colombia. You can see people using the same strategies because 
uh, Hong Kongers, they have this leaderless or decentralized way to protest. Protest is maybe it's the, um, I don't know, maybe it's the, um, the new way or it's the modern protest way to, to unite peoples to, to against the government or resist. And this is so similar to what we are interested in, the microorganisms, like they are, they are also distributed, they are communicate with each other with so many different ways. We can see in our modern or contemporary technologies are trying to do. So in that time, we are in different countries, different social contexts, and we try to exchange our experience, what we concern about from different continents. And I think this is the, the most amazing process I ever experienced. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about um, how the, the project was presented at Ars Electronica. Uh, uh, I, I know you did some workshops. Uh, what were those workshops about? I know you also invited some people to those workshops. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about um, what were the outcome for you of those workshops? And, and in a way, what do you think about the next stage for, for this project? You mean the workshops here? Yes, yes okay, the workshops okay, here. Because I would like to say something just shortly, that the workshops in Colombia also is like, in some places, digital technologies are not an option. So it's not necessarily that this same project is produced, but yeah, there is no access to digital technologies. So we need to create some other kind of networks and processes. Uh, and the workshops here, uh, it has been really a great experience for us to have the chance to have conversations. Uh, with people from all over the world and have this table of conversations that make us feel close and that we could try to build the umbrella, but even further share the experience, um, the resistance experience belonging, of, belonging to different communities because the experience is pretty, pretty different. And we had a chance to hear, to hear all of them and share also how we feel that has worked in our, in our spaces. Maybe. You can share a bit more. Yeah, um, I, I guess people maybe already see our exhibition place. It's um, really briefly, it's like two walls and four big tables. And we put our, our umbrella prototype there and also we put many materials which we are using to building these umbrella, umbrellas. Also we put um, 100 prototype of uh, this um, uh, this, um, how can I say? The biofilm, the biofilm prototype, which we people can easily just take away to their own hometown or try out with their own communities. It's kind of like an invitation. When people has this uh, interest or curiosities to do something, to maybe adapt or maybe to situate it in their own like communities, we are really welcome to those people who share in this resistance experience for, uh, to us. And also maybe they can try out what we're trying to, to do more, yeah. And, and what's the next step for the project? I mean, do you plan to show it in another place, in your own, I mean, you, you did already show it in Colombia or, or at least you did some workshops, that's what you said, Natalia? Yeah. But I mean, do you think to show it also, uh, I don't know, in, in other places? What, what are the plans? You are both also, still studying, no? Yeah, uh, we are both stu still studying in Berlin, for sure, and about the project. We're gonna exhibit it in different countries, maybe this year, like from Taiwan, from Colombia, maybe Canada, yeah, and maybe China also, still contacting, but there are still some people interested in it. And about the project's next plan is like, as Natalia said, we are not trying to serving a solution because we, when we talk with many people from different uh, backgrounds, we know they are have many different situations. So maybe we are not gonna publish something as a standard, as a professional product that tell people that, oh, you have this server, you can, build your own autonomous network, just use it on the street. It's not a solution. We don't need that actually. So maybe for us it's more open the whole process. We want to open everything 
the prototype we're trying now, we want to do it like open source code from G maybe on GitHub or some other places. And all the tutorial we are doing, we also want to put online and maybe try another iteration and iteration. This is our plan, I guess. Yeah, I think it's important to mention at that point that our project is an articulation of open resources. Since the, the hardware of the umbrella that was developed by Andrew McNeil to the digital layers that build the platform for chatting and sharing. So everything is open source and that's why of course it, it following this track of, of creation, it, it goes open source again. And what we're going to do is to do the co-creation workshops with the communities and share in our platform the outcomes that might be some other prototypes or yeah, maybe some other versions. And we actually already have an invitation to go to Cali which was one of the main centers for the protest for the social movement in 2021 in Colombia. And this makes us really happy to connect also to the communities there, which inspired also the, the process. Great, thank you. Um, Christian and, and Yuriko, um, cultural heritage uh, policies, uh, I mean, in many countries, especially in countries where, where there is a lot of cultural heritage, like in, in Peru, are very restrictive, um, and they make any piece of, 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 of historical artifact untouchable. Well, of course, for many reasons, but the interesting thing about the 3D replicas is that they enable you to touch them, to manipulate them. Uh, but what do we lose, or, or what do we gain? I mean, out of, of the project that you've done, what, what do you think we, we've gained or, or we lose from, from such interaction with the 3D replicas? I mean, taking also into account that you did the project already in Peru, which it's a different context of doing it here, uh, in which, the, I mean, really it's impossible to touch uh, such objects. And, and there, there is definitely a different sense around uh, um, um, historical artifacts, I mean, pre-Columbian objects. Bueno, eh, quizás el principal aspecto que se pierde al realizar ese tipo de proceso es lo que llama Walter Benjamin como el aura, ¿no? Eh. Uh, maybe the thing that we lost a lot during this process is what Walter Benjamin calls aura. Uh -huh. y, pero aunque sospecho que, el, que la naturaleza propia del objeto sonoro eh, soporta esas definiciones. ¿no? Though uh, we think that the, the object itself supports this kind of um, enunciates or definitions. Okay. Eh, existen muchos aspectos en que los, en los objetos originales eh, superan las impresiones. Definitivamente las cualidades estéticas, el material y los matices de uso eh, se pierden al momento de, de hacer una reproducción en 3D. Uh, there are a lot of aspects that these original pieces can lose or improve during the 3D impression. Uh, the, the aesthetics qualities, for example, the material and the diversity of uses, uh, they are possible because of the 3D impression, because they are printable objects. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitivamente el poder usar una impresión 3D Eh, sin temor de, de, de tener que degradar la pieza, es, es, una, es un tema súper contundente y positivo, ¿no? A very important and powerful thing is that these 3D impressions can be blow, like you can play the sound instrument, a thing that could not be possible because a lot of them are pieces from a thousand years old and it can, it can happen that you blow the object and it uh, damage itself, it can be broken. Uh -huh. eh, otro beneficio tal vez de las impresiones 3D es que la naturaleza de la instalación es de recorrer diferentes localidades, ¿no? diferentes este, emplazamientos y para eso tener una impresión seriada ayuda mucho, ¿no? podemos mostrarlas en diferentes lugares y tal vez también al mismo tiempo. ¿no? And I think that it's powerful also is that it can be repli replicable. <laughs> it can be in two different places at the same time because you can have like a two places of the same instruments and can be in different countries, maybe. And, and what, what about uh, the, the, the context of Linz? I mean, 
what did you took into account? I, I mean, the wind here at this time of the year may be a bit more challenging. Um, uh, what did you encounter that have, you have to solve? And, and also, what about the, the, the interaction of the people? I mean, the inter I mean, of course, this is an international audience, but there are also some local people. And, and, and um, I, I, I'm interested about knowing a little bit more about the interaction of, of the audience. I think that's, that's also very important. What do you think was the difference between how they interacted in Lima and how they interacted here? Claro. Bueno, esta versión que traemos a, a, a Lins es diferente a la de Lima. Definitivamente se hizo un gran esfuerzo en rediseñar muchas partes para que sean desarmables y livianas. Y bueno, hemos también usado unos nuevos materiales eh, que suman cualidades estéticas a la pieza. ¿no? Yeah, the first thing we thought about this trip was how can we get there with the materials that we have. Like if you have seen the, the installation, we have a tower and a windmill. So we try to make the materials portable and disarmable and lighter. So it's a little bit different from what we did in Lima. And we also have um, some up uh, materials that brings up the aesthetic qualities of the piece. Mm -hmm. eh, también ha sido un gran acierto instalar la obra en el jardín de la universidad, ¿no? manteniendo la presencia de la vegetación, que es un tema que hablamos al inicio y, y es uno de los pilares del, del proyecto. ¿no? Y así también como instalar la torre junto a los árboles como guía del viento. Uh, we also think that it has been very nice to come to be in the, in the garden because it, it is something that uh, stays from Lima, that we were in a, in a park and we have vegetation around and also the trees as a guide to the wind. So mm -hmm. the tower is in place between two trees. Mm -hmm. Y bueno, el viento también ha sido una experiencia nueva, ¿no? Mientras en Lima el viento eh, era constante en sus cambios, en Linz ha tenido la particularidad que a veces ha sido muy sutil, ¿no? Eh, aunque los vientos que acompañaron la lluvia estos días han sido por momentos bastante irracionales y, y han sido sorprendentes. Uh, Lima is very windy, so we didn't have like really problems there. But here in Linz at this time, it has been like a surprise because in some hours the wind was very subtle. And well, but these days that has been very rainy, it has been like a irrational surprise. <laughs> and some of the times the, the instruments were a little bit crazy, but it has been like very, very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. Y la interacción con la gente, con las personas, ha sido genial, ¿no? Ha mostrado mucho interés eh, por los mecanismos usados, tanto en la instalación misma, como también la, la tecnología propia de las piezas sonoras, ¿no? Eh, hemos tenido también la suerte de, de que los compatriotas vean un poco este, las piezas que, que hemos podido traer y, de hecho, creo que también compartir un nuevo orgullo, ¿no? Porque generalmente estas piezas están siempre en museos, Y, y de hecho la, la oportunidad de poderlas escuchar es un tema que generalmente no se genera en Lima tampoco, ¿no? Uh, we think that, yeah, the interaction with the audience has been really grateful. Um, a lot of people were interested in how the mechanics are used and how the technology behind them is constructed. And we also have uh, some cantors with Peruvian people, so it has been like really nice that they can be proud of how a sound instrument that is always like in a museum, untouchable, and without sound can be show here. And how can we share that sound? And I personally think that wind, it's a very powerful uh, nature thing, and it's really nice what the wind has to say to us. There is a topic that um, appears not just in the case of Peruvian uh, Preclumian artifacts, but in, in general uh, around the uh, uh, um, uh, historical uh, objects, which is repatriation. Um, have you thought of, uh, let's say, incorporating in, in new versions of the, of the work perhaps uh, objects that are in collections uh, in Europe or in the US and repatriate the 3D objects or something like that? Have you thought a little bit about that? Sí, definitivamente es un proyecto súper ambicioso. De hecho, nos interesa mucho eh, conceptualmente repatriar las, las piezas. 
eh, no solamente por un gusto personal o, 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 o por un gusto histórico, sino porque también creemos que esa información puede ser de vital importancia para los estudios arqueológicos en Lima. ¿no? Eh, sucede que eh, las piezas están eh, por muchas partes del mundo y es como una historia que está súper partida y es como un gran rompecabezas que, de las cuales tenemos poquísimas piezas y que queremos unir pronto. ¿no? Yeah, it's a concept that we have thought all about around, and we think it's a way, it's a symbolic way to repatriate, and 3D can help archaeologists and some studies because we have a lot of fractions around the world, and it's like a puzzle that we don't have uh, the idea of how big can it be, and as we said, like before, uh, all we have around these sound instruments, even, is guesswork, like, there is no like uh, precise uh, information, and that's that's how we think we can apply to other studies also, not just the installation to to bring those 3D instruments uh, to handle by other people. Thanks, thanks so much, uh, Yuriko and Christian, Tega and Sam. Um, this this work, um, Perfect Sleep, uh, brings a completely different type of interaction. Uh, what we can call passive or pausing activity. But what, uh, uh, that, that, that definitely takes into account, I mean, in, in, in the data that, that you've shown, um, CO2 reduction, the CO2 reduction factor, CO2 emissions, GDP over time. I, I have a question. Was it difficult to tap into the data and develop the calculations? How did you do the whole, the whole analysis of, of the data? Yeah, I mean, uh, no, it wasn't that. It wasn't that tricky. I mean, it's a very crude climate model that we made, you know. Um, and uh, but we did talk to we did talk to some climate scientists, and uh, we did read some you know some some genuine studies about um, about the relationship between uh, GDP and uh, and emissions, right? And the relationship between sleep and GDP. So we had we had some we had some you know some 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 you know pretty um pretty good research around those around those topics. Um, uh, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the model that we made is it, we often try to do a best sort of effort attempt ourselves to, to make um, these parts of the work. Um, and yeah, it was based on research and studies that looked at the relationship between GDP um, and sleep levels. And if you actually look at the modeling, um, there is sort of initially, as you start to sleep more, it's actually productivity goes up a little bit because a lot of the research says that we're all a little bit underslept, uh, particularly US, you know, we are in a US context, we live in Brooklyn. Um, and so, yeah, if, if everyone was getting a little bit more sleep, then, then actually there would be um, an increase in GDP. And then after that, of course, it goes down. Um, but I think, you know, I think part of the, the the challenge with the climate response is to try to decouple GDP with emissions, right? But, uh, but so far, that has not happened <laughs> internationally. And, 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 and tell me a little bit more about the use of the app. Um, do you have any insights or you learned anything about the interaction with, with the app? I mean, we're not tracking any sort of user encounters with it, you know, because we're just we're just not going to. But I mean, I think it is quite interesting to like look at um, the app store is absolutely like just rammed, just, uh, totally filled with like health apps and uh, sleep apps, and and it's it's extreme, you know, extremely prevalent in 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 Silicon Valley, right? This sort of idea that we're you know there's a kind of like tech tech fix to uh, to our own to our own sleep health but of course like you know like as we were kind of mentioning before like all those projects all those initiatives right like they're all about like uh, sleep to increase uh, productivity right so it's like a sort of uh, uh, ends up being like a kind of uh, further form of, of exploitation or or um, ex kind of extractivist logic right so it's kind of fun to just sort of like take a look at what that what that landscape is um, on, on the app store but we're not actually ourselves. Um, tracking any any data from our from our users, you know. But I think um, that raises an interesting point, which is, you know, obviously you could imagine uh, an app that does track your activities in order to estimate emissions, right? And I think this sort of points to a dilemma that we're seeing emerge in kind of discourse around net zero, right, where we're trying to balance emissions and sequestrations and and deal with 
the climate emergency in that way. And in that sort of attempt to, or movement towards net zero, there is this assumption of tracking surveillance, you know, better data, better quantification, so that our models can be better. And so I think there's a dilemma there, right, which is, you know, we know that surveillance often has political, undesirable political implications, and is that um, something that we want to see as we, tr as the, you know, we try and deal with, with climate and get a better understanding of, mm. of that balance and how far we, how close we are to net zero. So that's an issue that really came up with the project and I think, yeah, it's a sort of provocation there. I mean, I think the other thing I'll, I'll say about the App Store stuff is just, um, I th we, actually, we have sort of had this initial idea, which we, we probably should have done, um, <laughs> which was to make the app cost uh, $10,000. Right, you know, so, so to make it's it like a, a luxury product. So it's a luxury <laughs> product, right? Because I think, like you know, like this sort of focus on like carbon foot. You know, we we all know like carbon footprint is like a psyop by the fossil fuel companies, right? You know, this sort of putting positioning emissions like on this very individual level, right, is not a way that is at all helpful to be thinking about um, the the you know collapse that we're all facing, right? It's not useful, right? Except except the carbon footprint is useful if you're like a billionaire. Right, you know, like one moment of Jeff Bezos' uh, time of, of doing any activity is like, you know, more harmful than, you know, anything you can imagine, right? Like that's the a sort of appropriate place to, to think about a carbon footprint possibly, right? And so by making it a luxury object, you know, we would allow folks like Jeff Bezos and like Elon Musk to kind of like uh, volunteer, voluntarily kind of like annihilate themselves with sleep, right? Um, <laughs> which would be a desirable outcome, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously um, part of this project is also thinking about who has the privilege to be able to work less. Um, and if we, yeah, and you know, again, there's a lot of research out there that sort of promotes this, this the idea of the three-day working week or the four-day working week as a way to reduce emissions. And, you know, I think we obviously need a systemic response to that sort of transformation of work and, and productivity and not have it be sort of leveled at the individual. Yeah. I, I, I want to um, finish perhaps with one question to all of you. Um, because in all works, there, there are uh, central elements. Uh, one of their central elements are things that we do not pay attention to. Um, I'm talking about, uh, once more, uh, ancestral knowledge, sleep, bacteria behavior. And there is, a, this is, uh, there is a subtle connection between the invisibility or hiddenness of, of those elements with the perspective of the, of the other. That, I mean, we, we talked a lot about that during the, 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 the recent days at Ars Electronica about that, about the underrepresented, the less visible communities, which usually are not given a voice and, and which we try to highlight. Um, and, and they are also highlighted in, in the, in the uh, I mean, in, in the in the pre-arts electronic in interactive category. So in, in I mean, I'm not asking for a straight answer, but in more abstract terms, perhaps, um, how does this notion of the hidden, do you think can help, um, can help to bring a new perspective about the understanding of society? I mean, in order to, I mean, I mean, once more going back into this question about how can art help a new building, a new society? How does, how does the hidden also enables us to think in a different way? Maybe I can try. So I think that let's start by, like my idea is that for Western civilization human, everything is hidden. <laughs> Beyond self-benefit, self-improvement, uh, getting rich, everything else is hidden. And I think that if we want to remain in this biosphere that we have, that we are part of, we need to start looking at all those things and all, that, all those living organisms, all, all those living forms and all those ways of behaving uh, for us humans as living organisms, which I think connects a lot with what you were sharing, right? Um, because, yeah, beyond produ productivity, beyond having control, beyond understanding ourselves as some sort of powerful entity beyond nature and so on, um, I think that's, of course, the, 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 what art can do. 
and what, what, what art has done and what it's doing now and what we will all continue doing and is um, there is like moving away or taking off these heavy blocks that are holding back our lifelike behavior. And it's these heavy blocks of um, the control that humans aim to have over the other living organisms, the protocols, these bureaucratic processes uh, that we even have to face for creativity and so on and so on, because this is like what we have built through this rigid and some sort of uh, rational behavior that we think bring us out of the, of the nature. So just art helps to get rid of the, those blocks. And I think that's, that's, that's amazing for the process and that's amazing of also sharing all of this together. Thank you. Eh, bueno, creería que eh, dar una mirada al oculto eh, nos hace encontrar eh, tal vez algunas nuevas, o sea, nuevos caminos a respuestas ya cerradas, ¿no? Eh, y donde generalmente todo ya está dicho, ¿no? Y definitivamente el, este elemento oculto nos, nos ayuda a, a entender que, que todo eh, que toda racionalidad siempre, siempre fluye, ¿no? Y mmm, creo que también nos, nos ayuda a, a cuestionarnos, ¿no? Si en verdad eh, somos, estamos siguiendo el camino de la sociedad o estamos creando una, una mejor, ¿no? Uh, uh, we think that uh, see the hidden things that have been hidden for a long, way, a long time uh, give us like new ways to answer uh, old questions and also to question us if we are just uh, following the way the society has been every time or we are creating a new one in fact like if we want to build new new ways um, I think yeah I think art can play a really important role in sort of pointing to what are often called externalities, right? So things that don't get counted from an economic perspective. And I think particularly in the environment and climate space, that's really important, right? So what are these absolutely life critical um, things, microbiome, sleep, wind, like all of these elements of the biosphere that, yeah, just get edited out when we, when we let the, economic, the economists tell the story. And so I think, yeah, as artists, that's a really important role that, that we have is to sort of orchestrate or um, direct attention towards those things and how critical they are. Fantastic, thanks. I think we have... I'm, I'm, I'm yes. standing next to you. Okay. We do have time. Yes, yes. the answer is yes. I'm yes, so we, do we do have, have some time, time for, for a questions. short quest question and answer. So if you do have questions, um, we have the microphone for you. Just make yourself like visible uh, uh, to thank you so much for your assistance. It's, it's, um, I, I do have a question meanwhile to you um, as I'm interested is also what you have learned from cross-cultural collaborations in the online space as it was like also uh, for artists challenging times to create projects but not always be able to meet in persona if someone wants to answer. <laughs> I guess it's a question for us, right? Like cross-cultural online collaborations. And um, we met in Udekais in our universities and because like for instance, in our uni universities, they develop different uh, online platforms like, um, like something similar to Zoom, something similar to Slack, but they are all like distributed it's in our universities building this. So we, for sure, we're using multi-platform um, things to communicate with each other. But most of the time, I think the most interesting part is like we have a lot of this time difference. So actually we couldn't communicate so like a uh, frequent because we have 12 or 13 hours different. 
So actually we work really organic. We don't separate jobs. We just do our stuff and discussion, do a short meetings and then do our stuff. And the project just just show, shows up at the end. I, I don't know how to say that. The collaboration experience is maybe, uh, I heard somebody also say that the way we do things together is really like bacteria, because we don't <laughs> we don't do like you do this, you do that, and separate things, but it's like we do spontaneously. Yeah. Thank you so much for these insights, and um, we will soon learn what it is like and how it feels like to talk to a robot. And um, thank you so much, Jose Carlos. We will see you again. Thank you, dear panelists, for taking your time and giving us insights in your work. We are going into a short break. If there isn't any question, I'm, I'm taking... There is a question. See? You, oh. I, I'm so, so sorry. Yes. There is questions. Please stay here with us. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for uh, biofilm.net. I want to know how does the technical part work? Like, is it a, um, like a peer-to-peer -peer network or centralized on a server, or how does it work? And thank you. Okay, I, I will answer really short. Uh, the biofilm.net, you can see the yellow umbrellas. We hike the normal umbrella structure and replace the plastic surface with a metal net. So the shape can make the umbrellas like an antenna, which can enhance the uh, signal range, like the Wi-Fi or other, other signal waves. And inside the umbrellas, we using one Raspberry Pi with solar power bank. And that Raspberry Pi contains a server. We hosting a server sharing the local networks. And when we connect to the server, people can chat with each other. The chat server we are using called Matrix Synapse is an open source, open source um, chat services. And the one we are building now is each umbrella is a server hosting separately and also both sharing the Wi-Fi in the same time. And if you can, can like uh, attach another Wi-Fi dongles, then uh, ideally, each Wi-Fi, uh, each server can communicate with each others, and in the same time, our own devices, uh, just using uh, web browsers, because we are, I think in some situations, people won't have the motivation to download apps to just chat, right? So we choose this kind of things to build this simple, like, prototyping, and we hope we can Contact to, yeah, will be changing. Just as it's open, it will be changing. It has already three versions, and in every co-creation co workshop, we have a new one, yeah. So there's, ah, yeah, the microphone is right next to you, right? <laughs> Hi, um, this is a question for all of you. Um, I'm interested to hear your reflections on the idea of decentering. Um, we talk about decentering the place of humans within a post-anthropocentric world. We talk about decentering and interactive art where the creator is no longer the generator of meaning. So I want to hear your reflections in general about what it means to decenter and what the process of decentering is. Who wants to answer? <laughs> and we are going over time, guys. <laughs> who wants to who wants to, to, to answer it? I mean you looked at me first, right? So I'm I would give then you have the microphone. Um I mean I think again I think you sort of summarized your own question in a way in that like a lot of, I, I think, yeah, art, art practices are an interesting, uh, a rich place to sort of uh, question hierarchies, right? Question, yeah, like human-centeredness in um, an ecological point of view, right? If we think about the relationship we have to other species, um, but also how power is enacted. So I think that's playing out in your work, right? Where there isn't a sort of like top-down, centralized, um, um, you know, architecture to your system. Um, so I sort of, yeah, I, I guess 
<laughs> that we're sort of prototyping <laughs> ways of, of thinking through decentedness in um, in an applied yeah in an applied context. I just actually want to add a little quite a little thing there because I think it's quite interesting that in like a lot of people who work in technology are obsessed with decentralization, right? As if that alone is going to solve our problems, you know? And I think there's actually like a real over. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love. I love a good decentralized service, but like I think that there's an overemphasis on that as a replacement for actually having a, a concrete uh, political position. Very many kudos for that one. <laughs> Okay, I can speak quietly now. Um, my, my thinking on decentering um, is more about hierarchy, as you mentioned, um, Tego. Um, and it's interesting because I have to ask you the question, you're the one in the spotlight, and there's already a power hierarchy involved in Ars Electronica in you, for example, bring plants out onto a stage. So I wonder how we can engage with decentering given that so much of what we're doing is actually not decentering, and you are questioning that through a medium that is hierarchical by nature. Um, so this is just a, an open question. There's, I mean, no answers. I just wanted to see what your uh, reflections on that are. I mean, the good news is they can't run away. So, I mean, it, it looks like a longer discussion, and I don't think, I mean, if you, if you have something to say, please go for it, but it's like, um, a question where I would struggle to be in your position because there is not the one answer to it, especially not, you know, uh, the compromise. It's, but it, I think but it this is be... something where you really should say, like, I, I, let's grab a cup of coffee and go really a, a deeper into that because this is the good thing without the hierarchy, as you mentioned, they are on stage, but they are also at Ars Electronica Festival and they're happy uh, if you visit them and, and talk about it. So. Uh, this might be an approach since you have the festival. Yes, <laughs> um, and we have a tough schedule because digital communities are coming up. And so I would say we go into a break. Thank you so much for having been here. I know someone of you had a question. Please grab them when they leave. Um, <laughs> because uh, digital communities is waiting to start and then no one will have a break in case you need it or you want to reflect on this panel. So thank you so much for being here and see you soon after the break. And thank you. Yes.
community and two other folks. Really, thank you. It was. It, it, I think it's important. Thank and you. Just so that you don't think. Yeah, sure. No, no, no. Um, not at all. But, but follow them because okay. they're, they're available. So. I just didn't want to overstep. Thank you. 
welcome back of our, uh, to our summary of this year's Aus Electronica Festival. We hope you enjoyed so far. Uh, this year's motto is, as you all know, welcome to Planet B, a different life is possible. But how? Well, let's ask the digital communities as they are our next pre-forum coming up, hosted by Thomas Gegenhuber, who is holding the chair, managing socio-technical uh, transitions at Johannes Kepler University in Linz. In his research, he focuses also on sustainable transformations like open social innovation, as well as digital transformation. Very welcome, Thomas. The stage is yours. You want my... You have a headset. Oh, yeah, I have a headset. <laughs> I'm not used to that. So welcome to the session of Digital Communities. And Sarah kindly already introduced me. Um, and I think when we think about Digital Communities, let's just briefly think about what are communities, because it's a term that we use so often, and then, you know, meaning diffuses. and. I think there are three ways how we can understand and grasp communities, and we're going to see that also in the projects that we're going to present today. You can think of communities as an intermediate social structure, something between family at the nucleus and society, and there's communities in the middle. And either they manifest itself in space and time, be it in geographical location, but also virtually. You can think of communities as something, people that are bound together by activities, by practices. And you can think of communities as something uh, that is held together, bound together by values, interests, goals, and missions. And I think it is really great that the Ars Electronica from early on thought of an award about digital communities because it's an asset of our social life that we interact with, with each other. There's reciprocity, uh, that we strive for more than just being us. So there's a collectiveness to communities. And the Digital Communities Award, and I'm going to cite here uh, from, from the web page, it's a category where we award projects addressing social, cultural, environmental, educational, political issues in modern societies, activities that tackle cultural diversity, gender equality, citizen empowerment, that defend and support democracy, uh, the freedom of expression, and of course, uh, infrastructures for inclusive and sustainable society. And I think particularly of the theme that we have for this Us Electronica, it's the perfect spot that digital community category, category is also awarded in this year. And I'm also, I'm a professor here, I'm also part of the festival university teams and I had the chance with the students that we, you know, I gave them a personal tour uh, of the Digital Communities Awards. Um, and we discussed with them about the projects and one theme that emerged in these discussions was there's a theme about empowerment. Uh, either through new technologies allowing people with disabilities to participate in community life, but also like people raising their voice against war crimes and violation of human rights and atrocities we can't even imagine. Um, and I want to speak and I now want to give floor to the projects. And I think let's just welcome all of you on stage. So. Ori Yoshifuji is here with the robot, hi. Um, and the translator for the project, Maria Yu. And you're representing the Avatar Robot Dawn Cafe Ori Lab. Hi again. Um, and of course, Fatwa Mahmoud and her translator, Ola Suleiman, who represent the families uh, for freedom. And uh, thank you for, for joining us. It's, it's our honor uh, that, you, that you come here. And as you can see, we have translations. So when I'm going to ask questions, there's always also time, you know, we need uh, for the translations just for a note before we go ahead. But before we go into the discussion, we felt it's important that each of the project has a little bit time to explain what you do and who you are and what you try to achieve. And I would like to start 
um, with Ori. Um, and yeah, over to you. Yes. Hello everyone, my name is Ori Yoshifuji and I am the representative of Ori Research Institute in Tokyo. Sadly, I'm sick at the moment, so I can't be here with you guys, but through this uh, avatar robot that I've created, I can participate anyways. So, th so th my throat hurts at the moment, so I can't speak, and hence I'm using um, text-to-speech, and today I'm, it's a female voice. Actually, he's a man, so... <laughs> Get well soon. It will take a little bit of time, so please bear with us. This robot is my secondary body. And when I was a child, I couldn't go to school for three and a half years because of sickness. And During that time, the only thing I could do was stare at the ceiling, listen to the clock tick away, and eventually I lost the ability to speak with people due to not being, speaking with anybody. Next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> he is one of the members that helped me develop Orihime. So the question is, what is the body? What is participation? What is movement? What is existence? We are aware of the fact that not all human bodies are created equally, but we want to create a society where equality is possible for all of us. What we make is not only robots, it's not only the robot. Next slide, please. <laughs> this picture was drawn by one of our uh, friends and participants in the project. Uh, he's an ALS patient, and he's drawn this by eye input system. We have also developed a system for this eye to eye system, eye input system, and we have several hundred people that are already using this system, uh, people with incurable diseases. There is a difference between living and actually being kept alive. So our users, our pilots, they also want to express something while they're alive. They want to do something, contribute to society. Us as well, we want to connect with them and we want to work together with them. Next slide. 
最後のスライドをお願いします。Next slide, please. だから、私は12年前にこのロボットを作り、学校へ配りました。Hence, 12 years ago, I started this、uh, robot project and we started、um, using them in schools. だから、私たちは今、このロボットで仲間と働けて、さまざまな人たちと出会えるカフェを作っています。And now, 12 years later, we've made it possible to create this cafe where we work together with, fellow, with our fellow pilots. And meet a variety of people thanks to that. このカフェではこれまで出会えなかったさまざまな人が出会います。私たちは今、多くの人と会うことをしています。We believe that through technology and the use of technology that we can create a future free from loneliness, where loneliness doesn't exist. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> and we will come back to your project in, in the discussion.、Uh, before that, it is.、Um, an, An honor also to have you here, Fatwa, from Families for Freedom. And、I'm、for you, the same, maybe you can share with our audience what your project is about. And I believe we have a video at some point, and then you just say. من حركة عائلات من أجل الحرية حركة عائلات من أجل الحرية تشكلت ب 2016 وهي عائلات لمعتقلين واختفيين قسرا في سجون النظام بسوريا. First of all, thank you for having us here. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Fadwa Mahmoud. I'm a founding member of Families for Freedom. Families for Freedom is a group of family. Who have their loved ones、uh, forcibly disappeared by the Syrian regime in Syria? يلي أحبابنا وأولادنا هن بالسجون السورية وما بنعرف شو مصيرهم فمهمتنا نحن كعائلات نسمع هذا الصوت ونقول للعالم إنه هدول الناس موجودين بالسجون ويستحقون الحياة. Our main task as a group of families is to deliver the cause of detainees and forcibly disappeared in Syria. Uh, to the whole world and deliver the voices of the families of those detainees that are in、uh, thousands of,、um, their number is in thousands, and deliver the voices of their families to the whole world. I am a woman who is 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 a woman. فدوري أنا كأم وكحدا بيهتم لحقوق الإنسان سمع صوتي وصوت العائلات يلي بسوريا واللي ما بتقدر تحكي حتى عن أحباء أو عن أولاد المعتقلين. I my story is just an example of of all the stories of the families. For example, my husband and and my son have been disappeared since September twentieth, two thousand twelve. So in, a, in some days they will、uh, complete their 10 years in disappearance. I know nothing、um, about them, but、uh, this is not just about me. This is about、uh, thousands of others who have who are going through the same thing and are living in Syria right now, and they cannot even speak about that in Syria.
بدي اعطيكم بس شوية لمحة عن عن نشاطاتنا، نحن قدرنا نوصل صوتنا لكل لمعظم الدول او العالم حتى للمجتمعات الدولية يلي زميلتي مثلا حكيت بمجلس حق بالمجلس الامن وهي سابقة بتاريخ قضية المعتقلين، كانت موجودة زميلتي بمجلس الامن وحكيت عن قضية المعتقلين. اليوم نحن نتيجة الجهود اللي عم نعملها اشتغلنا على آلية لكشف المصير ومن عشرة أيام طلعت الدراسة لإنشاء آلية من الجمعية العامة لحقوق الإنسان لكشف مصير المعتقل. Uh, through our communities, we were able to, do, uh, to accomplish things that were not possible before. One of my colleagues spoke at the UN Security Council about the cause of detainees, and that was uh, a first. That cause was never raised there before. We were able to advocate uh, to, um, towards a new mechanism in the UN um, General Assembly, and they, um, 10 days ago they issued a, um, um, a report stating that it's uh, necessary to have such a mechanism, and that is all because of the efforts of our small community. Uh, uh, we have uh, prepared a video for you to show you a little bit more about us. المعتقلين بدي اخي بدي كل معتقلين سوريا المغيبين بدنا حقنا منكم بدنا نحاسبكم بدنا عداله وحريه ما رح نسكت لحتى نوصل للعداله والحريه حريه المعتقلين وكشف مصيرهم ومحاسبتكم بالمحاكم الدوليه You can't break me down. You can't take me down. Love and hate. How much more are we supposed to talk? Thank you very much. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm going to continue with you. Um, and, you know, um, I, I can't think of words and, and to describe and what, what you're going through. Um, and I think I can speak for all of us that, we, you know, it's so important that you, your project is successful and that, you, uh, that your demands, um, you know, become reality. Um, and because it's, it's also so powerful and how, how was the moment from turning from the suffering and, and to organizing, like what's this, you know, how did, when was the moment you said, you know, we need to do something, we need to organize the bus, we need to do all these things, like 
Can you tell us the story, like how the collaboration emerged? نحن كيف تجمعنا هذا شيء كثير مهم لنا نحن بالبدايه قضيه المعتقلين كانت قضيه كثير هيك ما حدا عم بيحكي عنها او ما حدا عم يتداول عنها نحن تجمعنا خمس سيدات وكل وحده مننا ب ببلد او بمنطقه جغرافيه بعيده عن الثانيه قدرنا نتواصل مع بعض عبر الانترنت وعبر التواصل و... 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 واجتمعنا اجتمعنا نحن بالبدايه خمس سيدات ونتيجه تواصلاتنا مع المجموعات الثانيه عبر ال... عبر التكنولوجيا اللي عم نتواصل فيها قدرنا نوصل لاعداد حتى بسوريا حتى بتركيا حتى بكل البلدان اللي متواجدين فيها عائلات للمعتقلين. Uh, at the beginning, it was uh, we noticed that we were just mothers and wives and so on, and we noticed that the cause of detainees has been uh, dismissed. No one was talking about it. It was not an important uh, um, thing to talk about, especially in political negotiations and so on. It was not given the right that it should has, and so we we were five women each in different country we were able to uh, um, to meet virtually and talk among each other and we thought that it's uh, really important to to do something about it and uh, so we got in touch with Syrian communities in different countries in Turkey in Syria in uh, Europe and so on and we uh, we found out those who are who have the same struggle as us and we joined together and we moved from being five women to being more than 250. هذا الشيء اللي خلانا نعمل شبكه تواصل عبر العالم ونسمع نكون كلياتنا على نفس لنفس القضيه، يعني مثلا انا بكون ببرلين رفيقتي بي بي بلندن، رفيقه ثانيه او زميلتي بي بي بسوريا او بتركيا، فعبر التواصلات عبر الانترنت عبر التكنولوجيا اللي عم نتعامل معها قدرنا نكون شبكه واحده وقدرنا نناصر لقضيتنا ونسمعها للعالم عبر هي هي التواصلات اللي عم عم نتواصل فيها. Uh, and that's how we were able to uh, form our little digital community with members in, she's in Berlin, her colleagues are in London and others are in Turkey and Syria. So we were able to use this technology to uh, um, to, to advocate for the cause that joins us all, that we have the same cause all together and we can fight all together virtually through the, um, through the internet, basically. بس بدي اضيف شغله ثانيه كمان مو بس نحن المعنيين حتى قدرنا نوصل صوتنا للمجتمع المجتمع العالم كلياته صار يسمع بقضيتنا وبعملنا وبالشيء اللي عم نحن عم نشتغله عبر التواصلات عبر الشبكات الانترنت والتواصلات التكنولوجيا Uh, so we were not not able only to join each other in this small community. We were also able to get support of other people who may not be uh, on the ground with us or who may not come to our uh, events and so on by virtually reaching out to them through this little uh, community. And we were able to get the support of, of many people also through the internet and through being, uh, through existing virtually. And you've talked and held speeches in, 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 in powerful institutions. And, and it brings me to the question, how do the people who are in power, who possibly could change something, how do they react to your campaign? Like what's the response when there's also this direct interaction? حقيقة أنا أنا كفدوة أنا من الناس اللي خاب أملها بالمجتمع الدولي للأسف أنا بدي أحكيها بصريح العبارة لكن نتيجة إصرارنا ونتيجة تواجدنا الدائم والمستمر 
نحن قدرنا نوصل لحتى تطلع هاي الدراسة مؤخرا يلي هي إنشاء قرار بقرار لآلية كشف المصير وهذا الشيء اللي أنا هلا أو أنا موجودة هون بدي استغل الفرصة وأقول نحن بحاجة لكل الناس اللي بتؤمن بحقوق الإنسان لتناصر هاي القضية إن كانوا فنانين وإن كانوا على كل المستويات نحن بحاجة لهاي الخطوة من الناس تضامن معنا لأن إحنا نعرف وين أولادنا وين أحبابنا هل هن أحياء هل هن أموات هذا اللي نحن هلا بحاجته لكن للأسف نحن عنا خيبات أمل من المجتمع الدولي. So I'd like to be honest here and say that we have been disappointed a lot by the international community. It has been it has been a very challenging and disappointment journey, but we insisted and we kept on and we kept trying until. Uh, finally, we were able to uh, have the UN issue this report that uh, says that it's um, a mechanism to uncover the fate of uh, the missing and disappeared in Syria is necessary. And so uh, I would like to take this chance to say to everybody who's listening, we need your support, we need you uh, to help us achieve this because we simply are families who want to know if our loved ones are alive or dead and where they are. So that's all. Uh, we're asking, and that's actually all that we want right now. And, and I think that brings me to a point that, that uh, if people want to support you, um, how can they support you, and, and what are your plans like for future activities? لا أنا اللي بقول إنه نحنا كتير مهم أي حدا وحتى من يعني خططنا إنه مثلاً أي حدا عم يعمل بأي مجال لو بينذكر شيء عن قضية المعتقلين أو إن كان بفيديو إن كان برسالة إن كان بأي تذكير بهاي القضية اللي نحنا عم نعاني منها من عشر سنوات أو من إيد عشر سنة فهذا بيكون تضامن معنا يعني نحنا مثلاً هلا نحنا مقبلين على هاي الخطوة اللي هي آلية كشف المصير أدى مهم إنه أي حدا يقول هاي الآلية كتير مهمة للشعب السوري أو لعائلات فقدت أحبابها أو أولادها لأنه الدول عم تقول ممكن تكون مهمة وممكن لا لا بينما الشعب لما بيطالب بهاي الآلية وبيكون معانا متضامن معانا فبيعطينا نحن القوة بيعطينا الإيمان بهاي المسألة لأنه الشعوبية اللي بتعجز تحمل المعجزات. Um, so um, simply talk about us, read about us, learn more about this mechanism we're asking uh, about, go to our website um, and, uh, and support us. Because right now governments are always hesitating, they're always not able to take decision, they are uh, always saying, ah, oh, maybe this mechanism is not necessary, maybe we can do without it, but if you people go online, if you like post a video or a post and saying, yes, I read about this and I think it's necessary that these families find out the fate of their loved ones and after 10 years of the um, conflict in Syria and nothing else have been done, maybe this would work. So that is important for us because we know governments have may hesitate, but we know that people actually know what is right to do and they can actually do miracles. Thank you. We, and we're going to come back later to you. I think there will be more questions uh, also from the audience. I'm, I'm going to uh, ask a few questions um, to, to Ori. Um, and I mean, you already achieved, uh, you know, a working and not, it's, it's beyond the prototype, but you know, like with the Ori Cafe, experimenting with the technology, over 150 people uh, joined your project and um, over the course of this project, what were like the key lessons learned from starting from the idea, we want to enable and empower people to get in touch with communities to uh, where the project is now.
Sorry, he's typing. Just a second. I'm going to ask shorter questions next time. Please be patient with us. <laughs> so he said I should add to the comments because um, I'm a side member somewhat. Um, well, people who haven't been able to go to school are able to go to school. People who haven't been able to work are now able to work thanks to this project. So that's probably our most success, the biggest success we have had. Um, if you want us to expand on it, not only the fact that they can go to school but also go to work, but also have been able to expand their social spheres and create friends beyond their own small community, um, is the part of our success, and that's what we are striving to do, is expand their social fears. And by doing so, many of our pilots and users have been able to discover new things about themselves. So all our stories are different, all their stories are different, but they're all success stories so far. <laughs> So, as he said, um, using the robot is not the goal. The goal is to participate in society and by that means um, evolve and expand your own societal sphere. I think that you can go ahead if you have any okay, questions. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> You know, on a, on a side note, yesterday when I walked through the So, it doesn't matter how much technology you have, if you don't have the possibility to use it, you can't uh, imagine using it, you can't uh, see the possibilities of it. So, uh, by using technology in different means and by showing how technology can be used, we expand this. So people who have already given up on on their social lives or on their lives or whatever, in that sense, by using technology, we can give them something new, hopes, dreams, and um, ideas. Okay, I think that's it. So did Okay, that's it. <laughs> okay. No, I, I was... Yesterday I walked with a friend through the exhibition um, and his an initial response is why not FaceTime and also when I'm talking to you in moderation that you know the head is shaking it's just so much different and also for me as a moderator different experience that you know uh, um, and, and you know you can see the power of it in, 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 in both ways and this brings me I think to uh, an important question is because as we know this is a social innovation in a social technical context um, it's working now in a small area what are the plans to expand the idea and you know like to scale it and create more impact uh, even beyond what you're doing now Well, as he's typing, I can also answer that a little bit. Um, so we are hoping to expand not only the Robot Cafe as the cafe throughout the world, uh, we are hoping to expand the use of Orihime uh, in 
our common households and to people who need to use it. And our dream is to have not cafes in every street corner, but maybe in every big city you can experience this uh, social community where people who don't have the social life that, again, normal people do have, uh, uh, can participate in society and by that means create friends and, so, and such. So yes, we hope to expand and we're always looking for help to do that. So if people are interested, please, definitely. Thank you, Maria. この姿で働いている様子を多くの人に見てもらいたいと思っています。できれば日本だけではなく海外でもカフェなどをやりたいですね。So we want to get people used to the idea that you can actually get to work through this means of appearance and uh, not feel them, as you said earlier, this is not just a robot, but there is a presence here and it's a different thing to a 2D call like a Skype call or a Zoom call. So we hope to expand, as I said, throughout the world and everybody gets used to the notion that you can also participate in society like this. Okay. We also believe that you can use it in the, no, in the travel industry. So everybody, if you ever want to come visit Japan, you can log in through Orihime and we can show you guys around Japan. As we are doing right now, maybe you've seen us walk around the area with people logging in. We've been showing them Austria. We've been showing them the exhibitions. So that's a possibility too. So, and by through the means of this Orihime, we also hope that in those specific countries or in each country itself, we can spread a light to the different problems that are in the societal sphere, not only loneliness, but yeah, social sphere, uh, barrier free or not barrier free. Things like that. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you one more question, but also in preparation for the audience, if you have questions, we soon, uh, Sarah will take over, and then we, we're going to have a more lively debate. Um, <clears throat> there's, I think you said it, you know, um, what, what, what I'm intrigued is, how do you get in touch with the people who want to try out? Like, if it's two questions. How do you get in touch with people who drive the robot in a way? And, and related to that, um, like, what is the institutional support? How do governments or investors react to, to what you're doing? It's all good. This is like a triple translation. So 
So f to answer your first question, so many people who have um, disabilities or are bound to their homes, they already have online communities. And through SNS, like Twitter, Instagram, and such like that, we looked for people who would like to participate. Who would like to participate, and a lot of people Several hundred people applied for it, and uh, through this media of SNS, our people knowing us has been expanding, so a lot of more people are asking to participate in the project. <laughs> As for support from governments and so on, uh, from the Japanese government, the support is there, but it's not really there. We are still looking for them to accept and use and expand the option more. So what we hope for the future is that through our work and through the things that we are doing every day that uh, people who um, are using this technology can expand their social fear and can um, change themselves and get rid of their loneliness, the feeling of loneliness that they are feeling day to day. We definitely want to try uh, having an avatar robot cafe in Europe someday. I hope so too. And I'm going to take you up for the Japan offer because I always want to travel there. <laughs> um, um, and I just, before we go into the discussion, I, I want to mention the third project uh, um, we wanted to talk about today. Uh, unfortunately, they could not make it, namely Kia Tadele from Strong Hair, but she sends her regards, uh, and of course you can visit the project in the exhibition um, and, and get an insight about her work. But that was it from my end. I would take over Please. to you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. We're going into the Q&A. So if you have any questions, um, you can see our colleague here. She, she's got the microphone. She will be happy uh, to bring it to you so that uh, we can hear you. Um, I, I can't not ask it now. I want to take Orisan in this, like, in this robot costume with me home. So then... <laughs> But the, 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 tr the real question I would have is also um, that as we learned, as I have been part of the jury, that one, yay, please, um, uh, one uh, big part is, of course, the cafe itself. As you are inventing new food and the kitchen is set because we talked to a lady who has been in the robot cafe. Um, uh, there is new food inventions and the kitchen is also really nice. There's a lot of creativity going there uh, on too, right? I love how he looks at me. <laughs> I'm looking into the audience meanwhile because we are ready to bring the microphone to you in case you have a question as well. Oh, over there, right? That's correct. So, yeah, it's not only the fact of the robot. We do try to involve everybody in the creative process. We also want to make sure that the ambience of the cafe is interesting and that people enjoy being there, spending time there. We aim not only to create a cafe, but also a community where people can 
uh, communicate with the pilots. So for us, it's very important that the cafe has this nice and warm feeling and uh, also the experience is good for everybody, the pilots and the people who come to visit us. There is a question upstairs, please. Yes, and uh, nice to meet you. Uh, uh, I have a question for Thomas Gegenuba, actually, uh, <laughs> regarding uh, the project, uh, the Syrian project. Um, basically, uh, Kentaro Yoshifuji uh, uh, displayed very well that the robot is not an end, uh, the goal uh, of the project, but much more like establishing relationship. And they have done that in a very nice and nuanced way using the technology to create a relationship, but also visibility and possibly uh, interest uh, from uh, business sector of our policies, for policies uh, so that the project will be upscaled. Uh, what you would be your suggestion uh, as a digital transformation expert uh, to uh, get an added value uh, to the Syrian project. So what would you do, what would you suggest uh, so that, uh, that there's an interest uh, from, from politics and also from the tech community so that the project would, be, would get more visibility and uh, would attract more interest? Like, what would be your strategy regarding that? It's a big question, I know. <laughs> it's a big question. Is it okay if I leave my role and answer it? Uh, 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 do as you, you're the host in the end. I'm just uh, passing questions I, on. I, so. Is it okay if I, my, my take on it for, for the project? I mean, it's always, there's two or three ideas uh, that I have in mind, and it's a big question, is, the first question is always, of course, um, or a challenge how you move from a niche and small project and, and scale it up, as in this case. And of course, there's always the question how you frame it and how you try to convince certain stakeholders. So it differs, and you know, I can't speak for the project, what, you know, what kind of stakeholders they want to be involved with, because it's also a source of identity. Some Projects prefer to go the venture capitalist route. In this case, I think it's more, uh, you know, because in the social area, you might want to talk to different people like European Union, et cetera, et cetera, where there are big grants where I think you can make the first step. Second is, of course, raising legitimacy and attention and awareness. And I think that's a good reason why we are sitting here. Um, and, and, of course, the third would be how do you build a community around a new way of thinking, interaction, empowerment, and I would say community enabling uh, or community entering technology, how can you build a community around it? And, and my, my sense is they're the first um, steps by, I think, what, what Ori told us, you know, we want to talk to people, forge networks, because ultimately any success moving from a niche to spreading out is the strength of networks and the weak ties. And I hope you also have conversations. Any more questions? Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hang on. Hi. Hello. Um, I have a question uh, for Mr. Yoshifuji, and since I'm uh, Japanese, I will uh, make a question in Japanese first, and then afterward I will translate it by okay. myself, uh, so that uh, he can probably type uh, the question and during that. あ、そう、えっと、私自身がえっと、12年間子供の時にえっと、ホームスクーリングをしていて、すごくあの、孤独を感じて uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, だ期間がすごかったんでそういうあの点でこのえっと吉藤さんのプロジェクトにすごくえっと共感しています。で、えっと私は今えっとベルリンでえっとニューメディアと勉強してるんですけど、その将来的に自分の作品とかプロジェク
とかでその引きこもりとか不登校の人たちのこう孤独を解消できるようなその人たちがそのコミュニティを作る、えー、とお手伝いをするようなことができたらいいなと思ってるんですけどその、えー、と今のそのをえー、とロボットカフェのプロジェクトで、えー、とその引きこもりとか不登校の人たちの孤独に、えー、アプローチするっていう、えー、とビジョンは、えー、と吉藤さんをお持ちでしょうか Uh, so I was just asked.、Um, so、um, now、um, I really、um, empathize and、uh, resonate with his project because I've been、uh, homeschooling for 12 years when I was a child and I, I felt、um, loneliness a lot.、Um, so if he has any、uh, thought to、uh, addressing、um, those、uh, peoples. Uh, hikikomo, uh, people who uh, are uh, st- who cannot,、uh, who are too afraid to、uh, communicate with people outside of their home, or、uh, children who cannot um, uh, go to school.、Um, uh, loneliness,、uh, their loneliness.、Uh, I'm sorry, I lost my、uh, no, it's right. track. It's perfect. Uh, but, no uh, yeah, I've just asked、uh, if he has any、uh, vision、uh, to address to those people's、uh, loneliness with his project. Thank you so much for sharing this. Thank you. I was also absent from school for about three and a half years, so I would like to be of use to you. Even if you do not go to school, you can play online games. What I think is the interface difference. I think we can lower the hurdle by using this kind of technology so that if you put on your costume, you can go out in front of people. Okay,、um, this is the. <laughs> I made a mistake. So, <laughs> yeah, you can hear that this has been translated through an AI, so it didn't make, probably a lot of words didn't make sense. But I think what he's trying to say is that、uh, he himself experienced、uh, loneliness through disease when he was a child. And by putting on, the, putting on or not using this avatar robot, you can、um, go beyond the Lonely, the, the sphere that you had as a child, only from an online community to a physical community. So, by doing that, you can also、um, fight loneliness, and then that's what we're trying to do. Thank you so much. And also,、um, add me, and we're going to play games together because I'm online as well. So, I'm, I would be here too if you say, like, you want someone to talk to. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. There was one more question, right? Yes.、Um, I give you my microphone. There you go. Thank you. Thank you.、Um, first of all,、uh, I would say、um, it's a great, great pleasure to meet Ori almost、uh, in person.、Um, I, I did、uh, a TV report about、uh, Ori Lab some time ago, but I didn't have the chance to interview him, interview you. I interviewed your partner. Uh, Akihime Yuki.、Uh, my question is to、uh, Sayyida Fadwa Mahmoud.、Uh, of course, he, you are here for to. I, w- I will translate it in Arabic, or you can, okay, you can do it, yeah. So,、um, uh, you are here to, to talk to us about the digital side of your story, but I am tempted to ask、uh, something different, which Which is not related to digital really, about what are your present actions. We know about the bus that toured Europe, we know、uh, about your actions all, all over the world with the,、uh, the UN、uh, organization, but do you have、uh, current actions that you, can, you would make us aware of? So, I think that you have to say 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 that ما فينا نلتقي مع السيدة فدوى وما نحكيها ما نسألها عن النشاطات اللي عم تقوم بها جمعيتكم حاليا إلى جانب اللي عملتوه بالباص اللي دار في أوروبا ونشاطكم مع الأمم المتحدة. Thank you. أول شيء سعيدة 
انه انت معنا حقيقه نحن كثير عملنا نشاطات لكن اهم نشاط هلا اللي نحن بصدد انه فعلا يكون حواليه ضجه وكثير ضجه قويه هو اليه لكشف مصير المغيبين والمختفين خاصه يعني يمكن ما حدا بيعرف ممكن يكون عدد اعداد المغيبين والمختفين حوالي 130 الف انسان فنحن بحاجه من 11 سنه نحن بحاجه لنعرف شو مصيرهم هدول الناس وين هن موجودين وهي الدراسه اللي عم نشتغل عليها وهي الاليه اللي عم نشتغل عليها نحن خمس روابط اجتمعنا الخمس روابط للعائلات للضحايا لحتى نطلع بهي الاليه um, so first thank you for being here for asking the question um, right now we are focused on uh, this uh, mechanism to uncover the fate of uh, detainees and missing persons in Syria there are uh, numbers and studies that stated that the number of uh, forcibly disappeared in Syria are around uh, a little bit more than 130 a uh, thousand people and uh, we think that is the most important priority now right now is to advocate for that uh, mechanism to be established so that we can know more information about those um, uh, forcibly disappeared يعني نحن هاي الخطوه هلا مبدئيا اللي اكثر حدا اكثر شيء عم نشتغل عليها وهي قد تعني للعائلات للناس يعني انا مثلا انا بجيب مثال عن حالي انه انا بدي اعرف ابني هل هو موجود على قيد الحياه ام لا بهي الاليه ممكن تصير اعرف انه هو موجود ولا ما موجود زوجي والاف الاف العائلات يلي هي بحاجه لهي لهذا لهي المعرفه في كثير من الشباب يلي اندفنوا يلي ماتوا بالسجون ما بنعرف وين هم مدفونين ما حدا سلم رفاتهم، هي الآلية نحن بتعنينا كعائلات، كأهالي لهدول المعتقلين، فنحن عم نطالب فيها بإلحاح شديد مشان نعرف أولادنا شو شو مصيرهم. Um, so we are a group of five uh, victim group organizations that are working together. Uh, we are working together to uncover the fate of our loved ones. And uh, she said, for example, and this is our main critical priority right now. I, I speak about myself as a mother and I know that my son is uh, disappeared and I just simply want to know if he's alive or not and if he, where, where is he? And there are a lot of people who recognize their uh, loved ones as uh, dead under torture through some um, leaked footage. We would also like to know where they are buried. Is that uh, we want to be able to be sure about their fate and know more about them. And that's the need not only of us, but thousands of Syrian families that don't know anything about their loved ones. Thank you so much. I'm looking if there is any question. Yes. <laughs> I know, yeah, 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 yeah. Getting creative. Um, first, I wanted to thank uh, Kentaro uh, to uh, make me forget the robot, but uh, remind much more of the presence. Um, I used to work as an innovation strategist uh, for a company, uh, um, actually for one uh, UN organization, and um, they developed a partnership uh, with a strangely uh, Japanese uh, pharmaceuticals company. Uh, to uh, solve uh, the issue of last mile supply chain in, uh, in Africa, uh, in one country. And uh, actually the, the UN company, my client, uh, suggested the use of drones, because you have a lot of drones, uh, it's really uh, current nowadays to uh, listening to this idea, and of course uh, the pharmaceuticals are was very excited about the fact that they were using drones. So I was the one actually trying to develop the business solution so that it would make sense. The only problem is that the focus was only on drones, so on the technology. So how do you manage uh, to, uh, for, for important stakeholders, just like to forget about the excitement of having a robot uh, a lovely one, 
and uh, to, so that you are able to convince them that the robot is only an enabler. So uh, how do you uh, create your argumentation so that the people forget about the robot the same way that we did uh, today, uh, that you managed to do today? Thank you so much for your question. So we wait for the avatar to answer it. <laughs> プロジェクトは障害を持った人たちだけの問題ではありません。日本がそうであるように世の中は高齢化社会になりますし、その中でどのように社会に参加していくか、孤独にならずに生きていくか考えなくてはならないと思っています。So, uh, we want to make sure that Sorry. Um Nowadays, the problem is not only the loneliness of the fact of people not being able to participate, but also the fact that we are getting older and older, and we want to help create a society where people of an old elderly age can still be able to participate. それは企業も同じような課題を感じています。どのように経済活動を続けていくかもです。おそらく日本だけではなく他の国もどのように社会参加し続けるか考える必要が出てくるでしょう。So we believe that not only in Japan but all many other countries will now be thinking about the question as how can we continue to participate in society with the ever-growing elder population. And this is not only a question for the governments, but also for companies, uh, how to keep this um, movement, uh, how to pe keep people able to participate. So. I have we receive support from our partner companies uh, to continue researching and continue finding new ideas how to solve this problem. And as for continuation of your question, the whole uh, looking away from the robot, we, every time that people experience the robot, as you said yourself, um, they stop seeing the robot and start seeing the person behind it. So the way we do it is that we actually get people to come together with the robot and have pilots logging in or other people logging in so that people um, support and companies and whoever we are trying to, stakeholders, uh, trying to support the movement, that they actually get to see the robot in use. Because if the robot is not being used, it's just a thing. And then again, it goes back to the novelty. So, yeah, it's definitely this is how we get people to experience our use, the use of the robot, the use of the tool. Thank you so much for having been with us. We are going into a short break and have then a wrap up from the perspective of some jury members. And meanwhile, I'm trying to robot nap a little Ori's son avatar and take him home with me afterwards. Um, so see you again soon while I'm trying to steal an avatar. Thank you.
jetzt ist es wirklich auch mal eine Frage von Herrn Schmidt. So we are all mates, I don't know. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> well, not sure that. We need to make a statement. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. No. No. So, yeah, I can tell you, I mean, I would put an open question to all of you. I mean, only one can answer first. And all the questions are kind of, uh, well, it's not everyone that really wants to answer. And this is for a question to people only by theory, who just are part of now, and who does nothing. You know, um, usually I'm 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 always um, like I come from radio, right? Mm -hmm. And we always say like it's water under the bridge because people who are now here they might not even know that they have the most ECG. So if I address it, then I make it bigger, mm -hmm. and yeah. I again get a big yeah. response. Yeah. 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 As I mean, I'm I'm I I, I wouldn't say it mm -hmm. because. Say like I get I, I also get gamma plus right, right? Mm -hmm. like yeah. uh, but I get right. a gamma. So yeah. and for people you don't know, yeah. 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 no. But no, if you want no, to, it's, it's not something I do only. I can yeah. just mention that what is your outcome? That how do you yeah. get from as a clinical um, yeah. for five hours mm -hmm. in this way? Yeah. Yeah. This is what the reduction is. Yeah. yeah. But if you want to say something, if you want to make an announcement, and really feel free, right? Um, you know, it's, it's your process and everyone deals individually and there's like, I have to make a statement here. So however you feel that you feel, but sit, just sit next to me, next to me and if you pick me, then I'm gonna open the panel for you that you have an announcement. My first impression is also think and really think mm -hmm. and I will say oh just to say something I mean I'm with you on the panel anyway and if people like well actually no then I don't so my as my, my second question is taking the head life can it be a different life is possible but how and um, what's your take on that uh, sort of question that you got and yeah I think yeah. it's I will take your back in the The good thing saying to Sarah, I'm saying this like 10 times to you <laughs> now, you <laughs> could remember it.
to the, sadly, uh, last part, which is mainly, um, what does the jury say? As um, I will be joined by the jury members of the Preforum Interactive Art Plus Computer Animation and Digital Communities. So um, I can finally sit down. Welcome uh, Simon, who was in the Digital Communities, and Thomas, uh, Jose Carlos, and Isabel. Very welcome. We are going to share microphones. Please join me at the stage, as I'm excited to get your <laughs> takes. On, and I'm going to uh, put uh, my uh, question uh, into the room. Uh, my, my first one is it's basically to all of you. As a jury, we were within the process stuck like in our category and uh, you know, shifting to all these awesome projects that reached us. And now visiting Ars Electronica Festival and seeing your pre-forum in a symbiosis with all the other uh, works uh, and panels, what is your take away um, from this year's festival? There's the microphones. Who wants to start? Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. I, I mean, I have a general um, uh, outcome about, I have several points that I want to point out, but um, um, something that I, I wanted to, um, to mention before is that um, during the keynote of um, Ernst Ulrich, uh, they presented this new report uh, from the Club of Rome called uh, Air for All, and, um, which is a kind of a survival guide uh, to help steer humanity away from, from ecological and social catastrophe. Uh, and, and, and he, I mean, they, they made a connection with a previous report from, I mean, 50 years ago. It was published. It was called The Limits of, to Growth. It was, like, very well known. Uh, it, it, they even said it was a bestseller. But um, I wanted to, before mentioning my, my points of view, I wanted to um, mention a, 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 another document that appeared at, at the same time. Uh, it was called Catastrophe or New Society, a Latin American uh, world model. Why? Because this, um, which was not a bestseller, of course, um, was, a, um, was a response to the limits of, gro uh, of growth and it came from the Bariloche Foundation in Argentina, in, in Argentina's Patagonia. So what, what happens is that the response was that to the limits of growth is was that, of course, I mean, this analysis is sophisticated uh, analysis using um, um, uh, computer mo models. Yes, it was very objective, but at the same time, um, it was quite questionable because it represents um, a very narrow view of, of what was going on using computing modeling. And of course, using simulation, it, there, was a, there was a system called World 3, which was used for that. Um, uh, but the interesting thing about this uh, Latin American uh, world model is that it, it um, in a way, it questioned, um, it gave a more disruptive perspective or more emancip emancipatory perspective uh, about uh, how poverty is linked to inequality, to injustice, and it, and Grill, that it was basically impossible to develop, a, I mean, I'm talking about 50 years ago, they said, I mean, 
we, in, the, in this little document uh, that it was impossible to develop a pattern for universal consumption on, especially on the basis of, of certain, let's say, Western parameters. Not, not necessarily Western, but defined as global parameters. And um, it, 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 the, the difference of this is that it, this was much more projected in terms of utopia, and it was confronted to the problem of science and technology uh, from the perspective of uh, development and with certain boldness through uh, a more interdisciplinary approach and taking into account, and this is something very important, a planetary scale, not a specific group of people that were thinking in a university or a, or a think tank. So, puzzling, uh, some of the things that uh, uh, were mentioned a couple of days ago around the Earth for All, uh, seems to be concepts that were already uh, developed 50 years ago in this little document. And that was, I, I was surprised about that. And, and funnily, I had this document, I was supposedly going to read a part of it uh, during the, this uh, trip, but I, I mean, I didn't have time, of course. <laughs> there were too many things to see. So I just want to mention that this example perhaps illustrates that, first of all, and this is very much connected now to the, to the um, to the, um, um, to, the, to the experience during the awards and, and, and the experience here is that we need to give visibility to epistemologies and systems of meaning which contribute to the, to the development of a social uh, representation from other parts of the world. I mean, if we really think of a planet B, it needs to be planetary, a planetary uh, uh, idea. So that means that it has to think in a wider, give, I mean, enable, much more open and 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 and, uh, and global dialogue. So that's I think that's one of the first things. And the other thing is that we've seen that many of the works at, at the pre are not just artworks, uh, and they are also based on processes. And hence, the, the real impact here is not in getting. In, I mean, it's not in the actual work, but it's in getting involved. And this is was also mentioned in the talk about museums, it's getting involved in a broader ecosystem of situations that uh, does not only help the audience, but also helps the artists to understand what they are doing. So I think I, 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 uh, that those are my, my first take-ons on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the last three, year, three days and also on the, on, the, on the winners. The thing with, it's very much and very many impressions. Um, I, I, I totally feel you. <laughs> Isabel, just you passed on the microphone. I, know. <laughs> I just I wanted I wanted to have this you know like okay then since you're um, like let's start with the circle and Isabel, um, what were things that inspired you that stuck with you where you said like oh wow. Um, I would say that um, uh, talking and thinking about this planet B, um, what I'm quite happy with is that. Uh, we assist now to uh, a certain kind of new dialogue between uh, technology and non-human uh, beings. And also that, um, for example, in the digital community or uh, price, we saw that um, technology is not only uh, a problem that uh, creates a lot of uh, issues in terms of environment, but can also be a little part uh, of the solution uh, when media are taken in a tactical way. Uh, for sure, I'm really interested by all the, the initiatives in terms of this innovation and less uh, uh, powerful uh, technology. And also, I'm quite glad that um, more and more we see um, how games uh, can also integrate this reflection and, and offer some call to actions. Um, in order to maybe um, act in favor of the planet, but also um, to make a social and economical and cultural change. That would be my takeaway. 
<laughs> and it's, uh, it's, it's you, you made the perfect lead uh, to Simon when you talked about games because you were in the digital communities category where a lot of pre uh, games were presented as well. And I have to ask you, of course, in a dual role as you were not only the, a juror, but you also a media artist who I think you met friends and you met uh, f friends to be. So <laughs> um, what were your moments at, at this year's uh, festival? Yeah, well, basically, I think it was um, actually always like, you know, when the Ars Electronica exhibition closed, then actually for me, the, let's say, more interesting uh, part started as the, at the festival, you know, where you basically really meet the people behind the projects, you can all come together, let's say, have a beer and this kind of stuff. And then actually, the, you know, hear about what uh, they are working on and uh, basically what kind of future projects they are planning. And I think this was really the inspiring moment for me here as well at the Ars Electronica Festival as an artist to um, basically, um, yeah, this kind of community aspect, I think. Uh, especially, I mean, I had the feeling um, that um, this year's Ars Electronica was like somehow connected to a very, let's say, deep um, a point of what as Electronica is about to bring the digital um, media art world together and especially, you know, right coming out of the pandemic, I think that was really what I, for example, was really looking for um, to, to, to meet uh, those, those persons, those people um, behind the projects. And I mean, of course, I mean, to see the project, it also gives a lot of inspirations for, for own artworks, like, like the uh, robot coffee, for example, I mean, it can be expanded, I mean, Right, um, they just mentioned it for tourism, but of course also for different, um, uh, let's say, uh, things like, you know, go on a theater stage and then, right, you know, we can also use this technology for, for so many other fields. And for me, this, that's also like a, like a big inspiration, I would say, um, to, to, to work with these thoughts in, in um, my everyday life, um, let's say business in a way. Yeah. If someone of you wants to add something, please just add it, by the way. Don't wait for me to ask. It's uh, way too strict for me right now that you're also <laughs> lo uh, looking at me. Um, but, uh, of course, I, I want to continue with, with you, Thomas, as you've been, like, really also, you know, uh, giving little tours when I understood it right. So um, you got even more uh, p other perspectives in form of questions to you in the end. Yeah, I, I think it's a perk when you're a professor here. Uh, and you're part of Festival University and uh, going with th the students through the exhibition and uh, the Festival University is also pretty interdisciplinary so you have a, a range and variety of conversations and, and that shaped certainly my impressions of, of this festival and also the conversations we had today and I have like three, four themes of course we have, a in, like I'm a business professor management scholar, probably not the usual management professor, but, you know, like, of course, I'm sh you know, looking at it from a sociological management perspective. So, of course, you have a theme of innovating, like the empowering technology we talked about today and we just talked about for the question of loneliness, but also, like, artists developing how they use games to shine critical aspects of, you know, like the community games, like the tactical tech. I also like the idea that runs through the festival is also denovating, scaling back, which is hard for us in society, you know? Like we liked you more, 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 more but like, like the Atomfa project with scaling back the nuclear plant that we chose and, and what does it do to the identity of a local community and, and the statistic exploration of that, that also runs to some of the project like the scaling back or also living differently and how do we, what does it do with our identity? How do we do that? And it, I think that's one of the ideas I, I take with me. And then two others, one of course, project about resistance, speaking out, all the data projects going against big tech. And of course, um, what we just before, like uh, uh, Families for Freedom in Syria. And the other one is really a meta, meta uh, impression is uh, and, and it runs through my work because I'm also sitting in other uh, committees for awarding projects, is uh, to what extent do we, because you also just mentioned, like, we know these things for 40 years, what we change. And, and I think 
what we also need to be aware of, and was a question also before in the audience in the other talk is, we always focus on newness, which of course makes sense because we want to expose to new ideas, we want to be inspired, but a meta reflection also that comes through in when walking through the arts is how can we appreciate more the hard work of moving from the idea to actually diffusing it and making it possible. And that's the work that is hard, that's boring off, it's not so exciting to watch. And you know, like this, 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 this thought I'm, I'm struggling with and, and want to think more about how can we appreciate more the people that make the ideas we are so interested in making fly them for a better world. That's what I'm uh, thinking of thinking a lot about after this festival. So what I get is that you see a lot of also social issues being addressed throughout these projects where you were, uh, that, 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 that stuck to you because it, would, it leads automatically also to my next question, which you now have answered, of course, which is uh, out of your profession and of your view on arts projects uh, where, uh, in your expert fields, um, what were topics where you thought like, ah, many artists or slash researchers are addressing it. It seems to be, you know, we, I, 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 the, 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 I heard that like, the, the head cloud would be loneliness. I, I heard already from your panels. And of course, um, the pandemic uh, did its part. Uh, that people, you know, focused on new strategies, but what were, not to say trends, but what, um, where are the artists and researchers engaged into what you found interesting also that they have a focus on that uh, maybe uh, uh, caught your attention, to say so? I would say that it was really related to the theme, but the ecological project uh, were very, very, very present. Um, and uh, maybe also biotechnological projects. So, um, yeah. As we're sitting here surrounded by plants, of course. <laughs> Roots and seeds, don't forget about them. They're about to end, but as we heard in the, in the morning, they are working on, it, it goes on, of course. Um, but um, you, um, the most, uh, I think you were most, I would say fascinated, at least that's what my take, by uh, some aspects that the projects tackled. And this is why I'm looking at you, Jose Carlos, again. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated that uh, we selected projects that really were discussing about things that are hidden. And I, I, I think that's interesting. I mean, it's a kind of a, I think there is, there, there, I mean, during the um, previous, um, during the, the, the animation discussion today, the, the forum, they were talking about the colonization. And I think that, I mean, it's not just a, a political position. It's, I think it has to do with the decolonization of our minds. Um, that, that means that that planet B, perhaps it's in our minds, should be in our minds. And, and in that sense, we need to be much more open to other other ways of knowledge and gathering information from other sources that are, I mean, material culture. I mean, if you see a piece of rock, it's not just a piece of rock, a pebble. It's comprised of, uh, of fossils. It's, it's a habitat. So, I mean, there are lots of things that are there, that, but we barely see them. I mean, we, yeah, we, they are there, but we don't see them in a way. We, we just take everything for granted. So I think that, that aspect of, oh, I mean, you all were also mentioning that, that uh, let's say, the non-human in a way, in a Laturian sense, but I mean, bringing that uh, aspect, but taking into account that technology matters, that there are certain aspects that you can do and you cannot do with technology. And I think that's also an important, uh, it, it adds a critical dimension to, 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 the, to the discussion. <clears throat> And maybe to pursue what you, you were just saying, um, I think that there is a, a need of a, a biggest uh, and deeper dialogue between uh, scientific knowledge and uh, other sources of, uh, of knowledge and um, to maybe end the hierarchy between these uh, different kind of knowledges. And I'm thinking about the work that is presented um, uh, in front of uh, Ars Electronica, 
Arts Electronica Center uh, by uh, Shu Li Cheng, and um, which is the, 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 the result of uh, a work um, in the forest in Taiwan and how uh, uh, forests make us dreams. And um, I, I really think it's uh, something we, we have to, to follow and to enhance, I would say. Thank you. Thomas August, when you look at me, then I think um, that you want to, to add something. Please do so. <laughs> no, because maybe it also fits, uh, but because I also see the topic of hierarchy, centralization versus decentralization, and it always matters on, you know, which area we talk about. And, and I always like to think about you know, centralization or hierarchy is not necessarily bad if you have a accountability. Uh, and and uh, that, that, that I'm, I'm always like, because thinking of you have movements in pendulum and I'm, I'm always wondering where the middle is and I'm always also a little bit hesitant to, not all old institutions are necessarily bad. <laughs> Maybe it's time to renew them. Like that, that's, I think what's also interesting, like, the explorations, how to deal with centralization, the ambiguities, working those out is, is certainly an interesting debate. I want to go with Simon uh, w one question further. There have been discussions over the panels also, um, which led to artists being very journalistic nowadays. And, but also, of course, since it's Ars Electronica, it's about research as well. So it's like this emerging place where disciplines come together, which we think is beautiful, but of course sometimes, you know, it's hard to fit them all <laughs> into one a category. So Simon, you are, I would say actually, uh, to, to me, you're more of the hacking community, and by the way, you're a media artist. <laughs> um, probably uh, many people will say, no, he's a media artist and he's able uh, to, to, to communicate uh, through uh, code as well. Um, how do you think it's just me seeing that, or do you think there is a trend that you know we find together, that science finds more to the arts again and to benefit from its uh, each other, and of course, uh, the journalism as well. Or is it just me because I'm excited to be at Ars Electronica Festival and it, I got struck more than all of you? Um, well, I mean, I'm, I think like um, probably as media artists, I think it, I don't know, maybe already comes with the definition of it, right? I mean, the, basically the, the medium uh, is quite open. You're gonna uh, choose for your um, stories you want to tell. And, you know, therefore, basically, I'm not uh, somehow not trying to limit myself basically to tell um, my narratives so and of course it can go into science or I can take um, scientific uh, papers and transform them into some art pieces or basically talk to journalists or you know based on, on the other hand give them images and then you know it's a starting point for journalism to, to write about so I think this is um, something I, I really I really like about um, the, the new media art world I think and um, I, but I also need to say that um, what what I also realized, um, basically also especially coming from other uh, let's say exhibitions worldwide, um, is that uh, like here at Ars Electronica, I think the topic of climate change and so was uh, actually much more addressed compared to other exhibitions. I definitely have to say that I was actually surprised by other exhibitions how they don't address these issues, and that was also where we let's say refresh. I mean, it's quite obvious if you think about it, right, but. It seems to be that um, there are not so many, um, let's say, artists or uh, let's say people working in that field um, really dealing with that topic. And I mean, especially, of course, like when you're coming from a digital, digital background, I think that's probably also another topic you need to deal with, I would say. But, but that's something I, I, I thought like, well, finally, you know, uh, or that I was kind of hoping that there are going to be more projects here as Ars Electronica. And, then I found them. That was really a good, uh, good surprise to me. Yeah. Um, I want to. Uh, time flies, and all uh, sadly, we always see how time flies as we have this countdown here. I want to do a little round and change perspectives. Uh, meaning, I asked you before what were your impressions, your takeaways, and now I'm asking you, like, what do you hope for visitors? 
are the takeaways since you've been before the festival started as jurors in intense uh, discourse to, you know, see all the projects, go through the projects, suggest uh, Golden Nika winners and so on. So what do you hope in this year's Ars Electronica under the motto of Planet B, what uh, visitors take away with, hopefully? I will s start with you again because it's so nice it rounds up with Thomas then coming to me, so it's... Uh, I think that, I mean, first of all, it's very difficult to do an exhibition and to think from the side of the audience. So that, that's already challenging, and I think that in some cases, the, the team at ours has worked on that quite well. But I think that what, what is important for, for, the, for, the, um, for the visitors is to understand that not all works have to be fixed, that the works could be developed further, that there are other elements that are not connected to the, to the only outcome that you see. Many of the projects that we've seen, especially at, at the Studiotopia, for example, they are super hybrid. I mean, you cannot define them as a, as a finished work. So I think that that's something that I, I hope that the people that uh, come uh, to see the, the exhibitions take, take into for the future. Thank you. Mm, to get back to the idea of uh, climate change and climate crisis, um, and knowing that uh, when something is very abstract and, uh, and sought in a very long-term uh, point of view, it's good to have uh, the opportunity to see simulations or um, immersive experiences that can show you actually um, what is happening. And like that, it's less abstract and maybe uh, it could help to change all our behaviors and um, that would be my my hope <laughs> yes I, I want to share I, I'm sharing it officially now well I think it, well, what a lot of projects told me in a way um, the sentence of it doesn't need so much high technology I think like low tech can do a lot of actually and you know it's not like this that you need the high-end computers machines or whatever it is Actually, it's really like about the story you want to tell, and I think this everything is there, right? I mean, this is something that uh, a lot of projects told me. Um, I I just had the opportunity today in the morning. Uh, Sean Ziegler was at the Bruckner Fest, and he said every festival should end or you know bring one message because especially of climate change, and we're always overwhelmed. But there needs always to be some hope that we still can figure things out. And uh, when going through, I saw also the message of, yes, we're, there are people trying to find solutions and still make it work somehow. And, and that I think is also important for ourselves or for the audience that they take away this message of hope. That's like uh, the, the perfect message also to end our panel with. It's, it's, it's so positive. Thank you so much for uh, uh, being here. Thank you so much. I hope you found uh, within the talks today something that inspired you, excited you, or something to think over. We are sadly at the end of this um, panel and almost take it while you can, of the Ars Electronica Festival. But as I said before, the festival may end. Ars Electronica goes on, of course. And so, um, in this sense, I say, hopefully we all meet each other again uh, next year. Thank you so much for being here. And thank, thank you. you for participating. Bye. Bye.